Good morning. Good morning. We are back for day 22, just as the judge is walking in to the courtroom. So we are going to go right to court. Yesterday was a very odd day in court, um, but it's February 22nd. It's Wednesday, the 22nd, and it is the 22nd day of court. I just want to know if this judge has any words about the shit that popped off yesterday. We had attorneys pointing guns at people, making jokes about being tempted. We had Twitter shenanigans. And we have a judge that is Ready over. Jury? Um, Mr. Griffin has a matter he wishes to Then why isn't he order. speaking? Good morning, Your Honor. Um, we are uh, discussing with Mr. Murdoch uh, his right to testify. Oh, shit. Or not testify. Oh, shit. And one of the issues that has come up is the scope of cross-examination. Oh, shit. That the state would be permitted to go into. Good morning, everybody. Should he testify? I've cursed four and times in the first minute, so you're never going to find this video on YouTube rule, again. The basic rule is when the defendant takes a stand, he waives his Fifth Amendment privilege as to <laughs> um, matters to which he testifies on direct. And, they want to limit it. Matters subject to cross-examination. Your Honor has let in over our objection, they want to limit um, the financial crimes that he testifies. Under 404B of, of financial misconduct. Where is my pen? And what we're asking is for an order excluding the state nope. from being able to question Mr. Murdoch on cross-examination matters related to the financial crimes. This could be bait. Been put before the court under Rule 404B um, if we don't testify about those on direct examination. We need a ruling from the court at some point in time today before tomorrow. We're not putting them <gasps> up today, but we're what? asking that we be able to advise him of what the state is, will be permitted to go into on cross-examination should he choose You're asking for a limiting order. In order for us to adequately advise him and for him to adequately waive his right um, and his Fifth Amendment privilege and testify or not. And that's what we're asking. Would you like me to review with him at this time his right to testify or not testify? No. Not at this point in time, Your Honor. We, we, we have to. They want a limiting instruction. Get a, a understanding from the court as <gasps> to the parameters of of the waiver of the privilege. Is it is he waiving? If he testifies about the murders, can he? Is he then subject to cross examination about the financial crimes? Right. They want a limiting order on that. That's that's what we're asking. All right. Waters. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> obviously the general rule wow. is, is that cross is generally wide open, and that goes for a defendant wow. who testifies. Uh, Your Honor, Rule 611B mm -hmm. on the scope of cross-examination expressly says that a witness may be cross-examined on any matter oh, relevant to any issue in the case. And of course, Your Honor, they has Rule 404 and 403, the financial matters independently relevant. But the rule goes on to further say, Creighton, slow down, my dude. So even if that had not happened, these matters, which go right to the part of the credibility and frankly the uh, ex extensive dishonesty of this defendant would be relevant if he took the stand anyway regardless of the 404 so independently that. under that that rule of the credibility aspect it would be uh, it would be admissible under rule 611b that. but again your honor has ruled these uh, matters as relevant in the case and so that clearly within the scope of cross uh, your honor citing state v uh, gilbert and gleaton uh, 273 sc 690 uh, they said right there uh, as i think the defense recognized when the accused takes the stand on his own behalf he waives his privilege against compulsory self-incrimination and must answer all proper questions all proper uh, your questions. honor taylor v state which i believe may have been overruled on other grounds but 258 sc 369 uh, when the appellate elected to testify, he waived his right against self-incrimination and became subject to cross-examination <laughs> like coming. any other witness. And then finally, say in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Brown v. U.S. 356 U.S. 148, uh, it says, it's talking about a defendant in a criminal case, it says if he takes the stand and testifies as an own, in his own defense, his credibility may be impeached and his testimony assailed like any other witness and the breadth of his waiver is determined uh, by the scope of relevant uh, cross-examination. He has no right to set forth to the jury all the facts which tend in his favor without lying himself open to a cross-examination on those facts. Those are the general and well-established rules, Your Honor, and they're particularly relevant in this case. And so uh, we no. believe that, that uh, those financial matters would be well within the scope of this particular we, matter and authorized by the rules. We are not on 1.25 speed. Creighton is speaking at 1.25 speed. Sure. Just briefly, Your Honor. And no one told him to stop. To credibility. I mean, the rules are pretty strict as to what evidence of criminal conduct can be used to impeach a witness's credibility, and there are 
limited to convictions, and that's um, Rule 609. Your Honor has let the financial evidence in that's a good argument, Jim. theory of motive, and you've done a 403 weighing test. And, and Your Honor, I, I think when you get to cross-examination of a defendant, I think Your Honor has discretion under Rule 403 to prohibit the state from further inquiry in this case on, on the financial evidence which they contend is you know, a motivating factor for the crimes. And that's, and, and so the Brown v. U.S. and all the, I, I don't disagree that that's the, the black letter law, but the question is, you know, what's the scope of cross-examination? And uh, here he's charged with murder. He's not charged with financial crimes. He's charged with murder. And we're asking the court to limit, the, you know, the waiver of his Fifth Amendment privilege to the murder charges. Yes, sir. You know, again, moving back to uh, 607, uh, of course, the credibility of the witness may be attacked by any party. 608B allows uh, examination, a cross-examination of a witness concerning their uh, this morning popped uh, off hot. Uh, aspects of truthfulness and untruthfulness, which this clearly goes to, as well as 608C, which talks about bias, prejudice, and any motive to mis misrepresent. And again, we're not just talking about purely dishonesty and credibility, which I think is alone more than enough, we're also talking about examination on issues that are specifically relevant to this particular case uh, based on the 404 ruling. This is not a stunt. I think they want to be able to advise their client and the Rule judge's ruling will determine how they advise them. Portion of 608. So that's where we're at. See evidence of bias, prejudice, or, or any motive to misrepresent by maybe shown to impeach the witness the judge either like, by no. examination of the witness or by evidence otherwise deduced rule six yeah, he's not inclined to limit it he is disinclined to acquiesce to their request and 609 also addresses the issue i am not going to issue an order in advance limiting the scope of cross-examination uh, any objectionable matter must be addressed on a on a uh, as the evidence is presented and not based on any advance ruling by the court. Boom. That's the answer. He's not going to testify then. But we knew that was going to be the answer, Jim. I appreciate you're doing your job. Jim's doing his job and putting it on the record. Come on, man. Your Honor, the, He's putting it uh, on the record. He's protecting his client. The, the, but the, the judge, we knew what this judge was going to do. It's not an evidentiary ruling. It's the scope of his privilege. And, and so would he be permitted to assert the fit, for example, if they're permitted to ask questions such as they intend to on cross. And that's- I can't give you any advisory op opinions about uh, the evidence and the scope of cross-examination, the scope of his privilege. Uh, you, uh, that's, I'm willing to uh, review with him the scope of his privilege against self-incrimination. The court has been consistent what, uh, ruling this way the entire trial. To. We will, certainly, we will certainly need to have that colloquy um, at some point today, at the end of the day, perhaps. But, the, but for the court to issue some blanket order uh, limiting uh, Why is the there scope so much of cross examination, uh, that's unheard of to me. Yep. Again, Your Honor, I'm not. The, the question is the scope of the waiver of his privilege when he gets on that witness stand. That's what we're asking for, not, not an evidentiary rule. Well, Mr. Um, Waters has some cases there. Um, you waive your uh, Fifth Amendment when you choose like to, to testify. And, uh, They're trying to say, can he waive his Fifth Amendment in and this case do, only uh, and not the others? Look at what you have as well. It's a fair question for the defense. Anything else? <laughs> Nothing to venture on. Let's bring the jury. Bring the jury. All right. We're, I cursed a lot at the beginning of this stream. We're never going to find this on YouTube, so go ahead and share it out. Let's roll the intro. Let's bring the jury, folks. Wow. Looks like Alec Murdoch might testify tomorrow. I'm going to put I'm gonna put up a poll in a minute. Do you think he'll really testify or not? Give me a second. Hey there. I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts. 
not. Let's get into it. We are busy bringing the jury just a few housekeeping matters from me. Good morning. Good to see you all. Let me know where you're coming in from, what you're drinking. The jury is present. I've got hot water and lemon. Thank you. Good morning. I don't know what the next witness is going to be, but this lady. morning was special. How's the jury doing? Exhausted. I'm exhausted, Your Honor. Well, we're now in day number 22. I like that all week. Case. The days are going to line up with you the dates. You may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, defense called defense Mark defense. Ball. Mark Ball. Uh, lawyer? I don't know. <coughs> all right. Let's see what today holds. I'm still shooketh after yesterday. Okay, this got way too loud too fast. As they deal with their feeds, we have to redeal with our feeds. Mark Ball. B-A-L-L. Mr. Ball, will you tell the jury a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? What do you do? I'm a lawyer in Hampton. I practice with the Parker Law Group now. Yep, former PMPD I partner. lived in Hampton for 20 plus years. I now live in Rum Gully here in Culloden County. Have for about eight years, nine years. Um, I've practiced how long, mostly How long law. have you been a lawyer? Oh. Let uh, him finish. 33 years. It's gotten hot this and, morning. Uh, where were you born and raised? In Ballantyne, South Carolina, up above Columbia, about 20 miles. And uh, when did you move down to this part of the state? I started with the law firm 34 years ago. I moved down. Um, I was a law clerk at first and have never left in, since 1988. Do you know the defendant, uh, Alec Murdoch? I do. How long have you known him? 34 years. And uh, did you practice law together? We did. About 20 something. Uh, did you have to pay back clients too? Personal friends of his. Yes. I mean, and, and I don't know if he said Fern Gully, family. Rum Gully. Yes. My, I don't my know. children grew up together, as did everybody in the firm. And, and your wife, uh, Lisa, would she become good friends with Maggie? Yes, sir. How does Lisa feel about paying back the theft? I got questions about On that. The, um, do you remember the evening of June the 7th? I do very well. 2021? Yes, sir. Um, what, how did you learn about the I didn't realize how Maggie and Paul? It was about 10.30, and one of my partners, Ronnie Crosby, tried to call my phone, and before I could get to it, he called my wife's phone, and the only thing she handed he said, give me, hand mark the phone, and I... He said Maggie and Paul had been shot and get over there. And so I scrambled and got over there. I live about eight or 10 miles from there. I live over 911 was called at 10.06. And and why this whole law there? firm knew uh, by 10.30. What was going on to, you know, see what, what was, I mean, we're out in the middle of, you know, nowhere. And, uh, you know, somebody calls you and says, your law partners, you know, wife and child have been shot, you go. I mean, and, and who did you go with? I went with my wife, Lisa. And, and when you got there, who, who was on the scene, do you recall? Yeah, I came in by the cabin, what, what's referred to as the cabin side of it. And where law was enforcement a, was. Ambulance was pulled up next to the, what I would call the hangar building. It was pulled up there and then Barry McRoy's vehicle, he drives a SUV of some type. And then there was a police car Wait, pulled who's off to Barry? the right-hand side, probably 50 yards before you get to them. And I pulled in right behind them on the left hand or the right-hand side of the, the driveway coming in, and then walked over. Will you remind the jury who Barry McCoy is? Barry McCoy is <laughs> the chief of the fire and rescue here in Colleton County. Isn't it adorable that he just when calls him first name Barry instead of saying McCoy the fire chief was, was there? He was there. He was standing there speaking with a deputy, and. There were two EMT paramedics standing over near their their um, ambulance or 
And when uh, when you pulled into the, uh, I guess the the lower driveway by the cabin, uh, had any blood roadblocks or barriers been put up to stop cars from coming in there? I wonder None. if they're talking about the crime scene. I got there about 10:50, 10:52, something like that. Did everybody? Did just you have a everybody in this town conversation with any law enforcement officers about the need to, to block the I, entrance? I, I did eventually. Um, I was talking to Barry about. Like Barry. I had found out just before I got there, somebody had called me and they work with sort of the maintenance side of, of fire and rescue and they had heard come across the, the radio that there were two dead. So I, I suspected that Paul and Maggie had, had passed away. They, so when I got there, I was talking to Barry and asking him some questions I could see Randy kind of through the alleyway between the dog kennel and the, the sort of wing shed that comes off of the, the hangar. I and think Buddy Alec expected half the, the town to show up when he called. Over, and then I spoke with him. He activated the law and, firm and phone tree. You he talk about the need to, to block there. the entrance in, into the Moselle property off Moselle Road. We did just briefly. He, he said, I, I need to get this blocked off. And I don't, I think he took a phone call or something and I walked back to tell my wife what was going on, and I saw another deputy coming in, so I walked out to the, the head of the road there, and I said, I think the sheriff wants this blocked off. And then I walked back. So the lawyers just got right involved. Was. And then. Did, did that entrance get blocked off? Lawyers be lawyering. Yeah. What happened? People just kept piling in. I mean, it just. Who? I mean, it was a, it just more and more people kept showing up. Uh, roughly how many cars do you think piled in? I don't know because shortly thereafter I walked around to the other side, but then how do you know people were piling many, in? When I walked back over there an hour and a half later, there were a good many cars over there. And when you say you walked around the other side, I don't think we need a diagram, but just tell the jury what you're talking about. Well, there's a dog pen if you from where I was standing, the dog pen would be to the left. The aircraft hangar with two wing sheds coming off of it. This is before, be directly this is in before front of Sledge showed up. There's a, a skin and shed that would be to the far right and then directly across from the hangar shed, probably 50 or 60, 75 yards, would be another storage shed, equipment shed. And so I walked down almost to where the skin and shed was and then back around in front of the far shed, okay. the equipment shed. So you did not walk um, directly between the the shed and the kennels. No, sir. You walked around the the, the shed. Correct. Um, before you walked around the the shed, were you, did you stand and observe what was happening with within the takeoff? I think area? law enforcement's afraid of Alex's lawyer did. friends. I mean, that's why I think they were allowed were to just looky loo all over the, the freaking place. Law it's weird though. And responders had walked between the, the two areas, the, the wing shed and the we dog kennel. We always pin a comment and of I who is on the stand. Was, so that's up there. Up, very this is Mark Ball, up. former PMPED partner. And what was the weather? Mark Ball was, was the three button. Um, it, it hadn't, it wasn't really lawyer. raining, but it was one of those kind of foggy days that, or nights that it's more than just a fog. It, you get wet. And we know eventually it got where it was we it saw drizzle off and on and um, later on it, it it didn't rain hard but it just it was intermittently sprinkle in that kind of floating heavy fog. Did did you make any observations about um, water coming off the roof of the the kennel? I, I did later on when I got around to that side. Okay, what observations did you make? Uh, um, eventually, the water was running off. That, that dog kennel is built with a, a small cantilever on the front of it and then a longer part off the back, and water was dripping off of the, the front of the shed where Paul was. Was water landing on Paul? It was. And could you see where the water would then accumulate after it landed on Paul? It would, it would drain off. There's a, a cement apron right Maggie there. Maggie was covered in that feed room. At one was, point. There was water 
there. There was water in the gravel. It's unclear if Sled is here yet it, when he's talking the grass about this was to wet. me. I mean, you could. It, it wasn't raining so hard that you know you you couldn't just stand there without an umbrella. But it was drizzling enough that you were getting wet. And the the fact the that you, you observe water uh, dripping off the the roof onto Paul's body did that did that concern you? It did. It did. Why? Well, one I didn't think that you know it's a crime scene you don't want just water dripping all over the place but more importantly I thought it was pretty disrespectful I mean that's Paul was a good young man and and I quite frankly it just pissed me off I understand did you have a conversation with anyone about trying to prevent that I don't think I did about that aspect of it but it was I just thought that they, they should have done put a tarp or something. I mean, just out of respect. And if they had put a tarp, y'all would say they messed up the crime Maggie scene by putting put a, a tarp. What Easy I would up. call a, a tailgating tent, very similar to the media tents that are out front, those little lightweight, and they put that over Maggie. Right. But to my knowledge, they never did over Paul, at least while I was there. Um, when, when you walked around the the shed um, to get on the other side who was on the other side well I could see through the alleyway between the dog kennels and that wing shed coming off of if, if you were standing in front of the aircraft hangar it'd be the right hand side where Maggie was I could see Randy over there and Alec um, Alec much more infrequently but Randy was on the phone walking and I could see him and I think he and I got there about the same time he had come through the main gate. When you got up, what did you did you get up to, to greet Alec? I, I did. When I walked around, Alec met me about halfway um, where that equip, equipment shed is. Alec came as soon as he saw me coming up through there. He met me about halfway uh, in front of that shed and just went to pieces. He, he's Alec six four, six, five, whatever he is, and I'm five, nine, he, he pretty well smothers you when he hugs you. Well, and he was, what, what was his demeanor? He was devastated. I mean, he was crying. He was, I mean, just, just beside himself. And I told him we'd, we'd get through it. And did, he, um, he, go ahead. Yeah, eventually did Sled arrived on the scene. He did, but while Alec was oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. kind of, you know, I'm trying to console him and patting him on the back, and, you know, he said, look at what they did, look at what they did to them. Oh, that's all hearsay. I mean, just right off the bat. Okay. So during that Nobody objected. encounter with Alec, he, he referred to they with what they did, is that correct? Yeah, they. <laughs> you can see the, the prosecutors really are like, why is no one objecting? Until I was taking my wife home. I just thought it was an odd comment. The um, sled arrived uh, sometime later? They did. Do you remember about how long after your initial arrival, sled got on the I think That's inappropriate got, uh, here to say that they could have objected to, but you know, they didn't. I'm sure they were coming from various locations. but It's out there now, so they probably won't. Were there probably within an hour, and hour and a half of me being there. And... Uh, by the time Sled arrived, were there other members from your law firm and family members on the out on the property where you were standing? There, there were. By that, by the time Sled got there, pretty much all the lawyers in the firm, with the exception of maybe two or three, uh, one of them had small children and one got forgotten, and pretty much everybody that was a lawyer was there. Um, did and, and family members. All of all of Alex's family was there. Goosebump! I agree that it cuts were, both ways. Were you directed to because it might leave immediately be him thinking well, about distancing himself from it, or it might be a natural reaction. Eventually, we were. The coroner Old came case. over. Rich Harvey came over and said, "Sled was there. They were ready to start processing the, the scene." We, um, he said, "Y'all need to y'all need to get out the house." Or, and I said, "Are you sure about that?" And he said, "Yeah." And I said, "Are you sure we?" It's okay for us to go to the house. And he walked back over and asked somebody and came back and said, yeah. And what, I said, 
Did you have any concerns going I, to the house? I, I did. What, well, what were your concerns? Well, it was twofold. One, you know, this is a murder big scene, farm, and I don't know who's over there. Two people have been gunned down, and uh, you know, it's is it safe? You know, so safety is one concern, and the other is, is that part of what went on here? And so, is it, you know, is it where's the crime scene start and stop? And when you got to the house, did it appear it's that a fair concern? The, the house had been searched and cleared in any form or fashion. I didn't see any signs of that, but I don't. I'm not a criminologist. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not a defense lawyer. But I mean, it looked like just a regular house. But before you go to the house, did, did you have any conversations with law enforcement about, you know, your knowledge of Paul receiving threats? Yeah, you know, I, I had asked, or I, when I was standing where I had driven up, Buddy Hill had come over there, and he asked Buddy me if Hill? I knew, because I know Sheriff Hill, and Sheriff he asked if Buddy Hill. I had any idea of. I might it. want to do this and I said not really and he said do you know of any threats and I said you know, I know Paul had gotten since the boat wreck that he had gotten several you know threats and just people cranking off from all over the place not necessarily local but from everywhere and I would hear it from you know Alec from time to time and different just different stuff and so I told him that did um when you had that conversation with Sheriff Hill, had, had you spoken to Alec? I had not at that point. Um, I, ha I hadn't gotten over to him. When you had that conversation with Sheriff Hill, had you listened to the 911 call? No, sir. Okay. That, um, that thought of threats, was that an independent thought of yours? Jim, don't yell at him. Well, it was response to a question right. from <laughs> Sheriff Hill. <laughs> and It's a very lawyerly answer. Your thought process was about the boating acts? Well, that was the only threat that I I knew of that Paul had ever encountered. Right. How when, much uh, people know each other is so clear in this testimony was like Buddy Hill. He's like, oh, Sheriff Hill? It's like, yeah, Sheriff Hill. How the much house, they're intertwined uh, is very when, loud during this testimony for restaurant. me. Yeah. Who was uh, with you? Well, I mean, I probably can't name them all. I'll probably leave somebody off. But it because was there were so many myself, people at the murder Ronnie scene? Crosby, Lee Cope, Austin Crosby, uh, Neil, um, Alger, Randy Murdoch, Alec. Um, had Buster gotten there yet? Buster had gotten there, I believe, but I'm not sure. Uh, he and Brooklyn, I, I remember when they came up, but I can't tell you whether it was over before we left over there. I, it seems to me that they drove up at the house, but I can't tell you for certain. Um, and then there was Corey Fleming and Chris Wilson showed up, um, Lynn, John Marvin, um, just a host of people. Greg Alexander, chief of police in the embassy, who's a friend of theirs, so showed the, up. There were a lot of people in the house. A lot of people. Uh, what did you observe of the condition of the house? When we came in the door, we obviously went to the den, and we're standing around. The den and the kitchen in that house are connected, and there were pots on the stove, so Lee Cope and myself and I think Austin um, got the pots. I think I set something in the sink and ah. we stuck some in the refrigerator. Y'all cleaned up. When you entered the, the house, it looked like there was food out that had been prepared That's for leading. There was food on the stove, yeah. Okay. I, I don't recall seeing any plates, but somebody else could have picked them up. I wouldn't. But were folks cleaning up? Sure. You... And what time of day was this? It was probably 1.30 or 2 in the morning. Do <clears throat> um, you remember what time you left that, the Moselle residence on that night, early morning? I probably left at 3.30 or 4. I left when Alec was leaving. Which is what Buster said yesterday, when, that they left around 3.34. When did you go back to the property? I had a deposition the next morning, and I ended up having to take it, and then I got out there about 11, I guess. Because lawyers. And was Alec there when you got when you got there? I went over to the dog pen over that way. I had gotten a call that morning about 8 o'clock 
from Randy, 8 or 8.15, and John had gone over there trying to clean up and couldn't, just couldn't do it, I mean, emotionally. And right. Aunt Randy had asked me if I could see about finding somebody to come clean it up or did I know anybody. And I called the coroner's office to find out if they had people that did that type of work or knew of people that did that type of work. And ultimately, the, the coroner called me back and gave me the names of two companies. And okay. I gave those to, to Lee, and he started trying to run them down. OK. Um, Y'all, there's I inadvertently skipped over. That's not <coughs> my outline. Um, that's not a problem. When, when you were at the house, after the before, crime scene's cleared, the left about property the owners are so. left to deal um, with it. Were, were you there when sled agents came up? So and I'm not put off by him trying to arrange for that. I, I was. After I knocked on the door, the crime scene's closed. Somebody answered the door. For some reason, I got up and walked over there, and they said they needed his clothes, and to, I think swab his hands. I walked back over. Ellie had been sitting next to me on the couch. There's two couches in the den that sort of face each other, and then two chairs that are headed towards the kitchen. He was sitting on the far couch. And I walked back over and I said, Alec, they need your clothes. Can you step back here with these folks? Okay. And it was a male and a female. Okay. Well, before we go any further, let me ask you, were your clothes wet or dry when you were sitting on the couch? They were pretty, well, they were pretty wet. They weren't soaked, but they were uncomfortably damp. So why, and we noticed, so why was Alec dry? Damp as well. I would assume they are. I didn't reach okay. over and. And, and did you see how the clothes were, uh, I guess, collected? Were they put on a hanger, wrapped up carefully, or what yeah. happened? The mail went into what Alex's bedroom, at least I'm assuming that's Alex's bedroom, and he came back out, and then I saw Alex just kind of, the, the female agent or officer was holding the bag, and Alex dropped him in. There was one bag, multiple bags? I thought it was one, but I couldn't tell you whether it was one or two okay. or three. All right. Uh, went down. Um, yep, and we saw that when he was in the back seat with the, all the unbuttons of June the 8th, that his clothes were sticky. Deposition. Did you go to the property? I, I did. And you went down to the kennels? I did. I drove over there. Had the crime scene been released? It, it, it had been released. and. That's on sled. Randy that morning, he said, yeah, they've released it when John was down there. And that's on sled for and releasing the do? crime scene. Well, I just wandered around. There was a sled agent there. I think at some point Duffy Stone and Sean. Duffy Stone, deputy, the lead prosecutor. Thornton was there. And I think one of their investigators, but they were the over solicitor inside the hangar. And there was a, a sled agent. At least I'm presuming he was a sled agent. And I don't know who he was. It wasn't any of the ones that were working the case that I came to find out that were working the case later on that I can remember. And I did, looked, looked around at different things. Did you look in the feed room? I, I did. What did you see in the feed room? Well, by that time, I think Ronnie had either come up or was over there. Ronnie. Crosby. Your law partner. And I think Lee Cope was there as well, but I'm not sure sure about that I'm pretty sure and I was looking in the feed room and you could see you know obviously there was still it was still a pretty raw scene and well they don't were, clean it up were know, there still remains of Paul in the feed room that had not been collected at first I didn't see it I saw shot that's you know on the leading. floor steel Nobody shot cares. on the floor number two steel, steel shot. shot you mean pellets from a yeah you know, like Bird shot, except it was number two, steel. Okay, where and you saw that in the feed room? It was all over everything. It was on the floor. It was on the shelves. What? It was various places. Okay. All and over everything. I got to look in around, and there was a. You could see where a piece of buckshot had gone through, and you could see where it had knocked out, you know, or shot through twice where the, the window was, or is, two had gone through that. Um, there was some plastic crates or something, and you could see where one of the shot had gone through and had embedded in the, the window frame right there, the molding, 
and then there was a piece of buckshot laying on the, the ledge of the, the window. Didn't cell. they take pictures of that at night, though? Did, what did you do when you observed the, the shots? I, I walked back out and asked what I thought was the agent. And what was the agent? He what? said, we've got all we need. And so I walked back over there and looked around and then looking around down the, around the floor and all that, it just, there was a piece of Paul's skull about the size of a baseball laying there. Did that upset you? It did, very much. I mean, it just really infuriated me. And I don't know who I was supposed to be mad at, but it just infuriated me that they left it there. It had been murdered, and there were still his remains there. And there was a large blood spot and tissue out right off of the apron of that area right outside the feed room that was there. And it's kind of like walking across a grave. You just, it's one of those things you just don't do. All right. After you spent time down at the, um, kennel area, um, what'd you do next? I ended up going back to the house. Um, yeah, crime scenes are horrific. No matter, again, Terry Branstad or no matter Maggie's who killed Daddy Maggie and Paul, was this and will stay with several these other people law firm members that showed up there to them and went in the forever. House and it is terrible. Eventually went towards where the gun room was that afternoon. Did um, Sled agents come up to search the house while you were they, present. They they did. And they I, um. And I think the jury's seen a video of it. We don't need to play it. But were you present I, in the gun room? I, I was. I think they probably two thirty or three o'clock, something like that. They showed up, and I had had a discussion with that same agent. And I'm I'm assuming it's a sled agent. It could have been a sheriff's deputy, but I'm I made the assumption that it was a sled agent over at the the kennels and the hangar about. I asked if they'd figured out what kind of gun it was. And at that time, I, you know, didn't, I assumed it was a 223 based on the night before. Barry McRoy had said that it was, he thought it was some type of assault rifle. And I just immediately kind of went there. And that agent had said that it was a three, three something. And I said, a 300 blackout. And he said, yeah. And I said, there's one over there in the, the gun rack. And he said, no, there's not. And apparently Sled had been there sometime that morning or whatever. He said, they already checked. There's not one over there. And I said, yes, there is. And so later on when they got there, there, there was one there. So you, and you located it for Sled? Yeah. Um, the, the night, early morning hours, 2 or 3 o'clock before you left, um, had, had you seen the gun room? Were, I, I had. Were there guns on the pool table and whatnot? I, I walked in there. The, the door was shut, I think. I think the door was shut between it and the, the sort of a transition hall. You go through there, and then there was a bathroom, and then a, where the freezers were, and then it exits out onto the porch. And then straight ahead would be, I guess, in the original house plans, would have been a garage, but it was so odd. Den game room that Ellick had turned into a. I don't know. The gun stuff is weird. Gun room and um, large room, and I walked in there, and there were three shotguns on the table, pool table, right, and some other stuff, some shells and stuff, and and when you went back the next day, the eighth, <laughs> daylight hours, early afternoon, where it looked like things had been put up. They had been put up. There were no guns on the table. There were no shells. No nothing there. And so I asked what happened to that. And I was told that the maid had put them up. And so I went and asked her. Did, I, was it Blanca? And yeah, I went to Blanca and she said, yeah, I was told to clean up the room. And so I put them up and put them in the rack. Okay. And, and did you point out to the sled agents the guns that were on the table that you thought you'd seen the night before? I didn't point out the guns, I told them that there had been guns there. But when was this? Because on the Captain America sled video, there's still stuff on the pool table. But sled didn't really go into the house much. When um, you're on the property on the 
And no, she never mentioned yes, picking up the guns. Morning, uh, on, on the 8th, at some point in time, did, um... Yeah, Blanca never talked did, about touching the guns. You observed an, an employee that had been working on the property for Alec, individual by the name of C.B. Rowe. I did. And did you take pictures of his vehicle for some reason? I took pictures of a vehicle. I didn't know That's whose vehicle it was. Leading. It was a vehicle that had pulled up underneath of the, again, if you were standing in front of the, the hangar where the, the big door is, it would have been to the right. And there was a truck that had pulled up in there and it didn't have a license tag on it. And when I walked by it, there was a jug of Clorox and can't remember what else what? was in there, but it was a jug of Clorox, and I just thought that was where, odd. Where, so where I, was the Clorox? It was in the bed of the truck. Okay. And I took a couple of pictures of it and turned them over to sled. And why, why did you take pictures? It just looked odd. You know, two people had gotten killed, and, you know, there's Clorox around. Okay. Um, There's been some, I won't make a statement. Did you see any Brain. coolers on the property down there? I, I did. There Where was did you a, see a cooler? When I walked around the bottom part near the between the skin and shed and the hangar and the other shed, there was a open cooler there or it looked like a Yeti style cooler and I, I can't tell you whether it was a Yeti or not, but it was a, one of those thicker coolers. And there was probably a dozen beer cans around it that night. And the next day, when I walked by it, it was still there. Okay. I just thought it, with all the, the people in the hoopla that had gone on, that it didn't, didn't look very good. Okay. Did you, uh, <coughs> I mean, was that the only thing that stood out about the cooler, the, the beer cans around? The beer cans, yeah. Okay. Um, looked like somebody had unloaded a boat or something. Right. And just kind of thrown them out of the boat and forgot about them and left it. Did uh, I was drinking in a boat? What kind of law do you practice? Civil. Okay. Um, plaintiffs' defense. Mostly plaintiffs. Okay. Occasionally, I'll defend a you know small business or a farmer or something like that. But right. for the most um, part, it's it's all plaintiffs. The course of your practice have you had um, experience with getting cell phone records of you know parties to find I, out information I have it's pretty regular now I mean just about every defense lawyer asked and every plaintiff's lawyer asked because so many people are texting and talking on the phone when they rear in somebody or crash into somebody or whatever and you want to know if, if you ask them were you on the phone and they say no and you know it shows up on on the bill then yeah, they probably were on the phone. And as you know, part of your, I guess, concern about Maggie and Paul and Alec, did did you pull his cell phone records? Well, I was asked to pull them, and yeah, we provided them to both Sled and to your office, I believe, right. um, for Alex's cell phone records. And if if, if you're What? Trying to get information from an opposing party or something about cell phone records. Is, are the records more reliable than the actual handheld phone device? In your experience? 402. I, I, did you hear the objection? I, I didn't. So it's the lawyer, then you know you don't respond until the court rules. <laughs> Response oh, to the objection. Tinsley's in the audience today. Been testimony about deleted call logs, Your Honor, and this addresses that issue. Anything further? Objections overruled. I, I don't know that aspect of it. That's a technical. I, I get the records because they're more accessible than getting a download and going through the... There, there are cases that you may want to get a download, but the, the run-of-the-mill cases with truck wrecks and stuff, the, the records of the the cell phone call records tend to answer the question that I'm asking. Uh, you, you've known Alec for 30 plus years? Yes, sir. Do you, you recognize his voice? Yes, sir. 
And I think at one point in time were you asked to identify his voice on a video of down in the kennel? Huh. Yes, sir. And did you do so? Yes, sir. And you determined it was Alec's voice? Alec, Maggie, and Paul. And you told that to Sled? Yes, sir. Um, have, have you um, listened to a tape that's been played in this courtroom about whether Alex said, I did them so bad or they did them so bad? Objection. Leading. 401, 402, and beyond scope of this witness's knowledge. No, that's leading. Objection overruled. I was sent a, 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 a snippet to, and asked the question, Okay. What what it was and what, hang on I'm not getting your response so let's um you've got to let him finish we, we, even if you don't like what's coming play the snippet from a state's exhibit 153 for this witness your witness thank you your honor. and your honor I would I would object I believe that uh, this witness was not present for this conversation and uh, again would object under 401 and 402 in relevance to his commentary on that particular exhibit fair so overruled. Chat, you were right. Yesterday, the clip now says, States Exhibit 153, Alec Murdoch's second clip, They Did Him So Bad. That is exactly what the title of the clip is that the defense keeps using, and the state hasn't caught it yet. Sounds like they to me. Right. I, I played the snippet multiple times. And, and is it consistent with what he told you that the night of the murders? It is. You remember in, um, I think, February 2019 that Paul Murdoch was involved in a boating accident? I, I do. And uh, you're aware that he was criminally charged? I am. And um, and then Alec and I believe Buster were civilly sued? I, I, yes, sir. And, and did you work on the case formally? No, not formally, no. We were, I was about to get in after the murders, along with several other partners. Did, um, leading up to the murders, did, did you have conversations with Alec about civil case and the criminal case? I did about the civil case to begin with. Um, and then when the charges came out, I talked with he and Randolph. What, um, what was Alex? Uh, what, what, if you know what he expressed to you, his priority between the two matters was? Well, obviously the criminal matter was much more pressing for him. The and, criminal uh, matter was the priority. And in your conversations with him, did you you gain an understanding of his concern about the civil case? Yeah, somewhat. And, but, and but it... How concerning was the civil case? Well, I mean, obviously, anytime you get sued, you've got to be concerned about it. And, you know, it was the whole voting accident as a, as a whole was very negative towards him, towards Paul, and the entire family, uh, or his entire family. And so, you know, it was obviously a, it wasn't a nothing, but at the same time, I read the complaint, uh, several partners in my, lawyers in my firm read the complaint, and at the time that he was sued, the, the, the causes of action against Alec were drafted probably to try to get as much insurance coverage as, as they could, which is what you do as a plaintiff's lawyer. You, you're looking for coverage. It doesn't, you don't want to make allegations that get you out of coverage. And it was very vanilla against him. And the, the allegations against Alec were that I, I sort of referred to him and others did as well as sort of bad parenting. You had an adult child that the allegation was that you allowed him to go out and drink. And when you're 18, you pretty much get to do what you want. And you 
reached your majority. And so I, I didn't really, I thought it was very defensible as to that, those causes of action at that time, or that cause of action. And I think he did too. But so he thought he the thought. civil case was right. very defensible. E.G. not a concern. Yeah, um, some point in time, Alec, was he forced to resign from the firm? He was. Okay. September and, uh, the 3rd. What day was it? September the 3rd. And um, he remembers and, well. And after that, did you have an opportunity to look in his office? I, I did. Uh, he resigned on the 3rd. Then there was the incident on the 4th. And I left the scene over there on so, uh, Old Salkahatchee and went by the office. And I'd also been in his office on Friday after he resigned. Did, did, when you were in his office, did you find any paperwork that looked like he had been working on for the boating case? Not until the 5th. Okay, and what paperwork did you find on the 5th? The 5th, I went in and started really, because we have an obligation to those clients that he was representing, and I didn't want files just laying around. This was Labor Day weekend. All this hoopla and emotion of, you know, the, the murders, the, the yep. issues with Alec leaving the firm and, and then that Saturday. And so that Sunday I went in to the office and went to his office and started going through to make sure that any client files were put over in stack you know over there and as i was going through i i found checks that he had deposited with his telephone that were some of the the funds that sort of started all this mess with the um the ferris case they were laying one was on his top of his desk one was in a drawer i pulled out one of the drawers and there was a they were just tablet, there. a legal tablet that had um, numbers written down on it as far as debts and assets and you know just kind of the scribblings of kind of what what you owe and what you you've got and did it, I mean, would it be something that you would normally see on a net worth statement it, it would be the same information uh, when when i think of a net worth statement i think of the form that a bank sends you and but right. yeah net it, worth it, is what it obviously tinsley was looking for he was listing what he had and what he owed. And is it something, the type of format you've seen in civil litigation where defendants require to produce So this that is? Work? Not in the same form, but the same information. I think they're going toward, Alec was getting ready for that hearing on June 10th. Um, and skip to no, another topic. Um, pulled that information together. After Maggie and Paul's death, did, did you collect her jewelry? I did. I what? got a call on the Wednesday, I believe, after the murders on Monday from the coroner. His wife and my wife had worked as surgical nurses at Hampton Hospital together, and then my wife ended up being the supervisor over that um, area. And I then, so I, I knew them very well, and I'd known Rich for 30 years. He called and said that. Lori had cleaned up the jewelry and, you know, whenever Alec wanted it. And I said, well, I'll come get it. And so I met him, Ronnie Crosby, and I came over to his office and picked it up, signed for it, and I carried it back to the house. And, and within the jewelry, do you, do you remember the wedding ring and wedding bands and other jewelry? There were rings, I can't tell you. I didn't, there was, a, the thing that sticks out to me was she had a diamond bracelet on and it was in pieces. Right. And he said he tried to find all the pieces, but there was still some missing. Okay. But I wasn't paying attention so much to, it just didn't, this is, didn't feel right. This is not well described, but it's picking up the jewelry from the coroner. Uh, knowing Alec for 30 years, do you, you, after it was cleaned up, you develop an assessment of his relationship with his family, Maggie, Paul, and Buster? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. The person I thought I knew yep. loved his family or appeared to love his family very much. He'd take their calls, huh. he'd do all of those things. After, you know, 
September the 3rd, I'm not sure I know that person. Wow. And so, but he always seemed to be devoted to everything. Their ball games, their, he would aggravate the hell out of me when you'd be in a deposition and they would call and he'd answer it and, you know, you'd be in a meeting or whatever and he always took their calls. Whereas my wife and my children never called me unless it was a true emergency and <laughs> Alec took their calls whether it was yep. a, me. they needed, you know, a gallon of milk or, you know, they had something important to tell him. I mean, he always took their calls. And, and did you see them together frequently? I, I did. They went places. You'd see pictures of them. I think Maggie was a pretty prolific um, Facebook, text, whatever. I'm not on any social media. But my daughter or my wife would show me pictures of where they had been or ball games, different things like that. They, I, I never saw anything that indicated to me that there was any thing out of the way with any of the relationships. Including the the drug stuff. I had no Yeah, let me ask you, were you aware that he had an opioid addiction? None. And any of the were any of the partners aware that he had opioid None to my knowledge. I mean that was not a not a subject matter that ever came up. I mean it was right. and you know, Paul I think has been sort of demonized by this whole affair and it's it's not fair. I mean Paul it's like a lot of young people I know, you know, they kind of are trying to find where the fence is. Sometimes they, they get, you know, going a little fast and, you know, blow through some things. But Paul was a good kid. He was always polite to me. I never had any, I never had one single solitary issue with him at all. And I knew he had done some things, you know, that most kids, you know, or mischievous do and, and on at least one occasion I went to Alec and told him that I thought Paul needed to be throttled back a little bit that I th saw some videos of him driving fast and I don't know what Alec did but that was our firm was very much of a of a family I mean if you were a member of our firm and it didn't matter whether you were a lawyer or one of our folks. I mean, our, our And Alec our didn't care about well. fucking and over his family at the firm, did they he? all have a problem. And so it, 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 we look out for each other. And we did. Mm. Unfortunately, Alec betrayed that when he stole the money. Sure. And but uh, you know, the outward things that I saw of Alec with his kids and, and his wife were just that. I mean, they were what I observed. Not nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors, but they sure. were. They were. Um, they seemed to enjoy each other's company. All right. The prosecution they should stick to them. the fact that Alec had no problem betraying uh, them. Mr. Waters. And that should be. Please <clears throat> support. Creighton, take a deep breath, buddy. Mr. Waters, could I steal one of your waters there? Absolutely. Mr. Waters. Do you have some water? He was pretty good at hiding who he really was, wasn't he? There you go. Obviously. And there you go. You know him for 34 years? I knew him for 34 years, or I have known him for 34 years. Thought y'all were pretty good friends? Creighton, let him answer. So. Interacted many times a week. It'll be better for you if you just yeah. let him answer. His son Buster and my daughter were in school all the way from kindergarten on, and I would see him at work. Some, you know, early on, he didn't work for us immediately when he came out of law school. He worked for Jim Moss and Moss and Coon, and then he came to us about five or six years after that. But you shared a business with him for how long? Probably twenty some odd years. He was your partner. He was a partner. You trusted him. You have to, and I did. And outwardly, to your appearance, he was a good lawyer, he was a partner to you, he was someone you could trust and rely on, wasn't he? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first Outwardly, part. from what you <laughs> observed. Yes, sir. 
He was a good partner. He was a good <laughs> lawyer. He was someone uh, uh, in part of your business, somebody that you could trust on rely on. You can is that true? feel yes, how excited Creighton is. How excited he had a great relationship is. with his family. Is that correct? And I just want to put him in like a thunder that blanket or something. But you have just testified that you didn't really know this man. Slow down. Obviously, I did not. I mean, had had we known the things he was doing, we wouldn't have been law partners. There's no need to be aggressive with this witness. This witness will tell you. The uh, kennel video. Yes, sir. And you've had a chance to review that kennel video? A couple of times. And you and I have talked quite a few times, is that correct? We have. I didn't see the kennel video until probably a month or two ago. And but you've reviewed it here recently, is that correct? I have, several times. All right. And any doubt in your mind that Alec Murdoch, Maggie, and Paul were on that kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th, 2021? None. No doubt in your mind? No doubt. Do I need to play it for you again or no doubt in your mind? I'm Sir, well, let's talk about that just a little bit, um, and we'll talk more in some detail. But I want to go ahead and cover this. <clears throat> you saw Alec the night of the murders. I did, and you knew Maggie very well. And you knew Paul very well. I did. And you went to the there scene where Alec was. Is that right? I did. And did you even ride with Alec or take Alec back over to the house? I'm pretty sure he rode back over to the house. He and I think he and Randy, because their vehicles were impounded over there. And did you eventually, as things started to move forward, sit down on the couch with him back at the house? I did. Fix yourself a liquor drink? Uh, probably a heavy one. A whiskey drink? A vodka drink? Um, a lager and drink? did you talk to Alec about what he did that night? I, I don't know whether it was. Never heard anyone say you fix yourself talk, a liquor drink. But I, I talked to him several times, including before the, the masses got there, as to trying to figure out: Do you know anything? Do you know have any idea who did this? Because you were very did concerned. You want to get that? to the bottom of this, right? Well, for a lot of reasons. For a not, lot of reasons. For for the family, for what happened to Maggie and Paul, for the law firm, for all the people involved. All of it, I mean, and safety of. You know, if it was something to do with him and the law practice, we didn't want somebody to show back up at the front door and harm our, our folks. We didn't want them to harm any of the other lawyers' families. If, if it was some person that was deranged, we, we just didn't know. I mean, it just, this isn't an ordinary occurrence. Right. They were afraid. Your, your practice That's of law. fair. Your thought you were his buddy, been partners for 34 years, y'all are sitting on the couch. Is that right? Like family. And you start talking to him. Is he responding to your questions appropriately? He, he was. Answering the correct subject matter? He, he was. He was very upset, obviously. Sure. I mean, but he was, he was answering your questions. He wasn't unable to make sentences. He was. Sort of. yeah. And did you talk to him about what he did that night? Yeah. And did he deny ever going down to those kennels to his buddy and law partner of 34 years? He said that he ate dinner, laid down on the couch, took a nap, and then left to check on him. And now you know that's not true from seeing the kennel video, right? I do. How do you feel about that? And that wasn't the only time he told you that, is it? No, I, at least three times. At least three times. And this would be over the subsequent days? Yes, sir. Subsequent conversations that you had with him? Yes, sir. And he was always clear that he never went down to those kennels after, he, after they ate dinner? It was the same version of it, but it wasn't always just me. Okay, and we'll talk about that. What, uh, who else was present in some of those conversations? Well, I mean, there were other law partners, and I, I can't tell you exactly who all was there, but I mean, I know on that Thursday following this, there was, I heard him say it then. Okay, and there were other law partners there? Yes. Were their family there? Uh, I don't know whether they were in the room at the time or not. I just know there were law partners there. Was Jim Griffin there? I, I can't speak as to what he was present on the property, but I don't know whether he was there. And did what, Alec tell the same version of events that he never went down to those kennels? Yeah, he did, but I don't know whether Mr. Griffin was there. We were there before Mr. Griffin was there. Did in his conversations with you, did he ever change his story about who he checked first at the scene supposedly i've heard it both ways and and i i don't know whether it's just a 
I, I don't know whether it's just because of the, the trauma of the situation, but one time it was, he ch the first time I remember, he checked Maggie first and then went to Paul. And then I heard him say at one point that it was Paul and then it was Maggie. It didn't really matter to me. Right. Because he doesn't. It wasn't something I really was picking up on yeah. because Cause it's it was friend. horrendous either way. Yep. I mean, I can't imagine seeing my wife dead and my son dead in such a brutal manner. So I, I, I never put any real stock in that. But it, it, it did. It oscillated. It did oscillate from what he was saying. <clears throat> from, from the first time I heard it. But the story changed. Well, yeah, as to which okay. was which. I prefer when Creighton pauses and breathes. Over the days following this event, this law firm, as you said, was like a, like a family, right? It was. You thought you were very close to this man, just like you, you feel close to your other law partners and their families and the staff and everybody else. It, it wasn't just the lawyers that felt that way. It was, I mean, the paralegals, the funeral, the paralegals were there. Yeah. The law firm shut down. They were also on, we had to go on a heightened alert. I contacted SLED about what we should be doing because there was a statement that came out about there was no, ah, they didn't know danger. of any danger to the public. And I, we're left with trying to make sure that the 60 or 75 people that work with us are all safe and they go home to their families. And they, SLED responded, I called the lieutenant over here and he called me back that evening and you know, was very helpful as far they as they were worried somebody was going to come us, into the law firm looking you know, for Alec. He said, I, I don't know it's any specific fear. threats, but you know, here's some precautions. And I think what y'all are doing is the right thing. And they were, they were helpful. And, but there was still that under undertow of fear, you know, who did this and are they going to, and it just, people were just on edge all the time. And you're not a criminal lawyer or prosecutor, I think you said. I'm not. But no. still a lawyer. And so you and your partners, including his brother Randy, were very focused on trying to figure out what happened here. What is wrong here, correct? What happened sure. on June 7th, 2021, sure. right? Very focused on that, were you not? We, we were. I mean, it was taking a lot of time off. But he was not, was he? Oh. You've you know, said Mr. that before, have you not? I, I have said that. Oh. But I don't know, Mr. Waters, how I would respond if I'd lost, and I, I've told you the same sure. thing. I, I don't know how you're supposed to, act, to react when you lose your wife and your child in such a brutal manner. But no, to answer your question, I didn't see him on the phone like I was trying to call clients and did you hear anything? Did you see anything? Those kinds of things. So, huh. I mean, the answer is no, I didn't see him doing that. I wasn't around him all the time, but no, I did not. And you, you've already testified that you and other law partners and family and staff yep. were very concerned. Everyone about else is afraid for Buster. Everyone else is what afraid. Happened on June seventh, is that right? Alex not very concerned. And you thought it odd though that he was not concerned about any threats even to Buster, correct? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, the night that this happened, I asked Alec where Buster was, and he said, "We've gotten a hold of him. Brooklyn's bringing him." And I said, are you sure he's all right? And he said, yeah, he's riding with Brooklyn. And that's, I said, you think he needs but do you, is he really all right? or something along those lines. I don't know that it was exactly those words. And he said, he'll, he'll be, he'll be here in a little while. He'll, he'll be fine. But he was so addled. I didn't, I didn't hang anything on anything Ellick was saying. But after and, that, in the days that followed, you continue to interact with him. He never asked for any protection or expressed any concern about protection for Buster, did he? And not so, to me, he did not. not. To you. And I, you know, the only thing I can tell you is, that Fourth of July, he came to Ronnie's, Ronnie Crosby's house, and he yeah, had a pistol in his Everybody seemed scared for bag, Alec, but Alec, was, to me, was unusual. And of course, in classic, that's what's coming across from this. Alec Buster and Paul style, he ended up leaving the bag there when they left.
And I think that's maybe the point of the cross that you just let go. Just let, just, uh, that's about it. That's all you need. This law firm's been in existence how long? 1910. Sorry, I, had to, I had to order a scone. And We're no longer. I'm sorry? We're no longer. We're no longer. Alec did that. It wasn't until he came along, right? Until all this happened, right? Until nineteen ten. Twenty twenty one. September twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. And was a, a relative of Alex, his great grandfather was part of that initial law firm, is that right? His great grandfather was the beginning of that law firm. And was he also the solicitor for the fourteenth circuit for this area of the state? He was from uh, I believe nineteen twenty until nineteen forty when he was killed in a train accident. And then did the defendants getting into the family history is very interesting with this witness. Grandfather becomes solicitor. Buster started. The chief prosecutor for this area. Buster took over in 1940 and was the solicitor until 1946. He knows this family history real well. Randolph was appointed by the governor, and then was until he was 72. And his father became solicitor, is what you just said, is right, that right? Randolph. Until about when? Uh, Randolph was. 82 when he passed away, so 10 oh, years ago maybe, that's around not. there. And Buster became, Buster left the solicitor's office in 86 when he became 72 at the end of 86, beginning of 87, I think Randolph took over, mm -hmm. and Buster became the assistant solicitor. All right, and how long was Randolph solicitor? Until about 10 years ago. And was still an assistant when he passed, I believe. <coughs> Do what? I believe he was still an assistant solicitor. Mr. Randolph was? He was. And so was the defendant, too, wasn't he? He was, in some form or fashion. He had a, he had a badge. Did yeah. you ever see a badge that he had? I did. Where did he keep that badge? It's very interesting saw? to see that. Usually it was on the, the family. On his dashboard. Driving around what? with it in front of his dashboard? On his dashboard? On the audacity. This family is very, very powerful, were they not? Very influential. Good in use of witness, Creighton. Uh, I mean, they had a very good name. They had, you know. Good use were, of legacy, Creighton. You, they were known to help you with your problems. How important was they that were known family to help legacy you with your to the defendant? Very, or it seemed to be very important. I think you've said that it was more important to him than anybody else that you observed. It seemed, it seemed that way. I mean, whenever there would be discussions of name changes or anything, he would be very involved in that, much more involved in that than he would be in other business matters. <laughs> and he even talked to you about wanting, that being the defendant, wanting to be solicitor as well. At one time, yeah. Good use of witness. If Creighton would just change his tone <clears throat> a little to be more conversational, it wouldn't feel so adversarial. And there were when when you arrived. Alec was more interested in the name of the law firm, the law firm right? not when I arrived. than the business matters Randy of the law firm. Was Randy was there. Other law partners showed up. They showed up over the next hour and a half or so. Okay. From Jasper County, from Buford, from all over. And there were a lot of powerful attorneys at that scene as it was being processed, including the defendant. Is that right? Well, obviously, Alec was there, and the rest of us. And then I don't I don't know of any other lawyers at the scene other than us, us being our, our firm members. And was law enforcement always polite, polite and respectful during this entire process? Absolutely. And when they came to the house that day, the video where the uh, Jeff Croft came in and searched for those guns, were they polite and respectful? They were very polite. They, Did they have a long conversation because they knew family was in the house about trying to do this as delicately as they can without upsetting everybody and doing some big search and running everybody out of the house and all that stuff. Katie, and I can't I apologize, I can't remember her last name, she offered to take off all of her identification for gun and all of that, and we told her that, that wasn't necessary. That, <clears throat> okay, I can speak a little louder. Okay, sure. Sir, it's the worst witness box in That's the history of the world. We understand you. Well, it's, yeah. It's, um, yeah, they, they, I mean, Katie offered to really, you know. Accommodate? Be very behind the scenes, so to speak. And everybody, I've not had, 
you know, the vast majority of them have been extremely polite and very, very responsive. Katie to is the sled agent that searched the home that with Alex's brother walking because around behind of all the family her. there and the and the tragedy that happened. They were very delicate and respectful of that when they came to the house that day. Is that correct? In looking back, they probably were too much. But they were. They were very. Probably too much. Looking back, probably too much. I think the defense is wondering um, if they really knew everything this witness was going to say when they prepped this witness. Oh, Poot's scooting back into the courtroom. Welcome back, Poot. Did you bring any muffins? We've lost all of our focus. We want muffins. Please, Poot. You said uh, muffins. that Alec would always ride in his Suburban with that badge up in the front. So fucking appalling. Right? I don't know that he always did, but a, a, lot, of a lot of the time. He also carried, generally his, carried a pistol in the car too, didn't he? I didn't know that. I, I, I can't testify. His volunteer that solicitor I, badge that, on his I, fucking dash. I didn't know that. What was uh, Alec like with the cell phone? He was on it all the time, wasn't he? He was on the cell phone all the time. He would constantly be using it, constantly responding to calls in the middle of conversations, always had it with him to your observation, being his law partner for 30 some odd years. Is that correct? He, he was an obnoxious user of the cell phone. <laughs> and would it have been unusual for him to go down to those kennels without his cell phone with him? I mean, you I said that, I, haven't you? I, I don't know whether I've said it or not said it, but I, I would think it would be unusual for Alec to go anywhere without his phone. Obnoxious user of his cell phone. We've heard other testimony that his, he would get up and walk out of depositions on his phone. His, was he a very academic or oh shit, lawyer, or was he? Were his Creighton's having also? too much fun. Well, I mean, Alec was a very good lawyer. I mean, he. Mm -hmm. was a, I'm going to switch feeds because I want to see Alec's client. face. So we're going to go ahead and just, we're going to go ahead and switch it up just a minute. We might be a second behind because I, um, ah, no, that's going to put us way behind. Hold on. Academic lawyer. I there think I'm go. pretty good at figuring out where the seams are to, to figure out the solution. And I hate how peaky this sound I is. I think Alec was much more like I am. But I want to see his in face. In that respect, as, as far as looking at facts and, and talking with people, Alec, Alec never met anybody that he didn't, he couldn't talk to. He could talk to a fence post. Talk to a fence post. I think you've said that people were his trade. They, they were. And he yeah. understood the emotion of the cases very well, did he not? He, he, he did. And he could be very convincing with people, as you've come to find out from what all that you've uncovered. Is that correct? Absolutely. He convinced us for since 2006. Effortlessly and easily lied to you for years, and you didn't know it. Didn't Is know it, correct? didn't know it, and didn't catch it. In fact, you know. Let it, him go. It just, uh, the, the way he was doing it was very, very cunning. Cunning. Um, I don't think this is going the way the defense thought it was jury, going. The second jury has been a long trial, but remind them who she, is, she's, who she is. She is our in-house accountant, CFO. She's the money person, but she goes beyond that. She did management stuff. She would be the person that at one time she was kind of managing the non-lawyer staff, but she could still rein in the lawyers as well. I bet she could. Jeannie and Seconder is great. In the wake of all this, all right, we're ending our poll. We're Financial putting up a new that one. came up on September 4th. I got a new poll for you guys. She was one of the ones tasked with going through and figuring out the extent of what he had done. Is that correct? She and I worked a lot. And you worked on that as well. Is that correct? Correct. One, one of the things that has come up, and there was this issue that happened back in 2017 where we had <clears throat> At the beginning of the year, They've over the law firm the mics. depletes all the money, and then you have to start off the year 
well, money's coming in, and you may not have enough to cover your bills in January and February. So we do a, a loan, and generally the partners, ones that wanted to participate, would put money in, and then they'd get paid back as soon as we got on a cash positive in the new year. Y'all give me one and second. I'm going to see if I can make sure we're matched where up. Where Alec was paid. He didn't put the money in, but the check was written to him that wanted to participate. With, and it was I've put gone back in, and looked at it and made and sure they'd get paid back as soon as his name and Randy's sure. name appeared. But his name it, and Randy's one over the other. And it was just a it, fat finger or, one or just a, a missed thing with the mouse. And the check was generated to Alec. And then there was a second check generated, one in March, check one in April. I don't the one think I can see check was these negotiated up. in May. Negotiated in May, I think. The other check stayed on check his desk. Was negotiated in May. Was no, we're seconds the next off. October. I can't sync these two to get well, the other audio. I did Sorry, was I threw out. Our, my and goal. This is in our operating account. It's not. It wasn't client money. So it it threw our operating account out of balance. And when we started looking at it, then we realized that he wasn't the one that was supposed to have gotten paid. This is the theft from we his had brother. A, basically a powwow. Our president, Danny Henderson, went to him, talked to him about it, and Alec swore that it was just a mistake, and he paid back the money with interest because Randy had been out of his money. Was paid actually, it back with stolen money, correct? Well, I, don't, I didn't know that, but, I mean, he paid it back. And I think there had been testimony that somehow that got swept under the rug. It did not get swept under the rug at all. It, it was investigated, but everything seemed to make sense. It seemed like an error. The check was written to him. He cashed a check that was written to him. And while well, I might know whether or not I had an extra 123000 or whatever it was, or twenty one, um, Alec always seemed just sort of disheveled with his own funds. So it, it made enough sense, and it, it, there wasn't enough there to, to get in a brouhaha and, and you know, terminate somebody or create more of a fuss than, than it was, but it wasn't swept under the rug. Everything seemed to fall into place at the time. Now, obviously, had we known any of the other stuff at the time that we found out in September, then it would have been a different story. Who feels attacked but about being disheveled is, with your own funds? It got, got discovered. Oops, it was a big mistake, he says. He pays it back, and people move on, right? And that was in 2018. That was in 2018. And we're talking about the check written that was supposed to go to his brother that went to him instead. Right. And yeah. he was never one to loan money for those operating expenses generally. Is that right? I think he loaned once or twice. But once or not, twice. It wasn't regular. Right. And not around this time period, correct? I, I didn't go back and look at that part of it. I was one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, roughly something like that. One hundred twenty-one, one hundred twenty-five. All right. I was more concerned about how it happened to begin with. It, Randy's initials are RM, and Alex's initials in our system are RAM. So that was. And what he did was, was he gets that check, and instead of saying this isn't one hundred and twenty-some odd thousand dollars for me, he actually goes to staff a couple days later and says, "I lost that check. Cut me another one." Right? There's yes, the problem. And then he cashes that one, right? He he eventually cashes. He cashes the, the first second one. one yeah, in he, pretty short order, correct? He, he cashes the the first one. And there's in the October problem. The next year. And he then sits on the other one for an extended period of time, and then cashes that one, right? He did. There's Still the lie. Still the same money twice, right? Yes, sir. What was the word you used before, cunning? Very cunning. <laughs> I don't think the defense expected that, this witness to say the cunning. cunning. But he, he said, oh, it was a big mistake, and, and he pays the money back, and then people move on, even, even though they, because, okay, it's just Alec, that sort of thing, correct? Did they move yeah. on because it was other Alec? There like that, too, over the years. For example, using... Private planes Creighton's for personal having, use and billing that to the firm. Is that Creighton's right? having too much fun. He's never um, going to stop this cross. He, well, he's going to do this forever. Some, some of that, but the, the biggest thing was the credit cards using. He, he just wasn't a very the, good rule follower at all. He just he wasn't a very right. good rule follower. Well, yeah, I mean, anytime you're in a law firm or you're working for somebody, and you've got a card or a check that's got their name on it, then. You, you owe them a responsibility to spend it properly. And it's so other people's money, right? The it's planes weren't money. the problem. 
And he would spend personal use on the credit, credit cards, cards and the problem. Have to talk to him about that, right? Yes, sir. And that was going on repeatedly, correct? It, up until the end. Put tuition on a firm credit card for what? one of his children, correct? He did. <gasps> had to talk to him about that, right? Yes, sir. And he'd pay it back, and then people would move on, right? And that had been going on for years, had it Y'all were enabling some had, shit at the but firm, there were other people that would But not like him, right? Not to that not degree. Not like him. Not to that degree. The audacity to put your kid's tuition on the law firm credit we card. talked a little bit about the boat case. He thinks the rules don't apply to him. He's not but a bad rule follower. Those aren't his rules. In May rules. of 2021, Jeannie came to you and told you about what Annette had discovered about them receiving the expense check in the Ferris case, but not the fee check, right? Sometime in that time frame, yes. And your initial concern was, and you were concerned, you were concerned that he was going to try to hide assets because of the boat case. That was part of your concern, and the firm was not going to participate in that if, that's not what, if that was what was going on. That's correct, that he was either going to structure them or leave them in somebody else's trust account until it had passed. I mean, we, we, weren't, going to, we weren't going to fudge our books for that benefit. Uh -huh. And you were aware that... In the boat case, they were seeking a personal recovery against Ella, correct? Yes, sir. And that caused you concern because this firm was not going to participate in helping him hide assets because of this boat case, correct? That was your concern. He or anybody else. Yeah, or anybody else. And you had continued conversations with Jeannie over the next few weeks about this because she couldn't get a straight answer as to this what... He had done with those easier. fees, correct? Myself and Jeannie and at least two other partners. Lee Cope. Lee Cope and Another partner. And Ronnie Crosby. And Ronnie Crosby. And couldn't and, get a straight answer, could you? Well, we weren't getting a straight answer, we so straight answer. We, we continued. But we didn't want to make it a big deal if it wasn't a big deal. But because we Why? didn't have the information, we couldn't make a decision. Were you all afraid no, of him? Why? 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 In there to demand that straight answer, correct? Yes, sir. I didn't know that until June the 8th. But you knew it was coming to a head, didn't you? Uh, yeah. I mean, Jeannie's tenacious. I mean, she's going to get to the answer. She's not going to let go. Yep. Until, and it wouldn't just be this. It would be anything. Jeannie's tenacious. Times, Alec didn't have the money to pay it back and make it all go away, did he, this time? I, I didn't know that. But you know that now, don't you? Well, yeah, obviously. Every, the whole world does. That's fair. I don't know if Alec liked that chuckle at his expense. Um, Jeannie was tenacious, and that's probably why Alec was snapping at her Maggie about stuff. Friend. Who? Maggie was your friend? She was all of our friends, yes. Paul was, Paul was your friend? Sure. He was... Dear friends with my, particularly my youngest daughter. He was a good kid. He was a good kid. I mean, he had his issues like everybody else. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that's raised children. I, I, if they say they're perfect, then I, I, they need to write a book. But I, mean, <laughs> I don't think any of us want to be judged by what we did when we were 18 or 19. Do we? I don't want to be judged with what I did, or I really don't want to be judged with how I raised my children. But, you know, they. You know, those are individual decisions, but, you know, Paul was a good kid. He was always polite. He, I could have picked up the phone and called Paul and said, hey, I need some help over here on my farm. That kid would have come in a heartbeat. He was, he was just a good kid. Now, did he do some devilish things? Absolutely. Yeah. I hear about him, and, you know, occasionally if, if I saw him, I'd say something to him about it. But he was... He was a good kid. I mean, he was a great outdoorsman. He grew a garden. I mean, Randolph, who they called handsome, I mean, he'd do anything in the world. And any, after the boat wreck, the two of them were almost glued together. And, I mean, it's, it's just a total waste of a kid that had had never found his potential yet, but would have, I'm quite confident. And after this tragedy happened to the family that was this law firm, 
everybody was focused solely on that, coming to support one another and coming to support Alec Murdoch. Is that right? Absolutely. And the last thing on anyone's mind at that time was those dadgum Ferris fees when this happened. Isn't that right? And you've said that. We actually, at least myself and one or two others said, well, we'll have to put that on hold. Chad, I, mean, I see you. There are lots that believe Paul wasn't driving the boat. Subconsciously. The Murdoch family and those around them. We consciously said we're, we're going to. A number a, a seems to believe that Paul was not child. driving the boat. There's so no I, way I get you. We're going to be cruel. Chad. We'll, we'll get back to it later. And we did. But I think it's fair. I think it's fair testimony from him. Because right? he's or telling them what he thinks. Later. You're advised that, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Chris Wilson says he has those fees all along, right? That's what, we, what I was told. Because yeah. in the wake of those murders, he had managed to borrow Chad, some you money and I are from on the John same Parker, page. right? I found that out later. And he had managed to have Palmetto State Bank through Russell Lafitte give him $350,000 in undocumented funds, correct? I found that out later as well. Just after like after before, you get an email saying, yeah, I'm Chris Wilson, I got the fees. And that kind of put the matter to bed at that point in time, right? That was in July, yes. Paid it back again, and, or at least you think. And just like before, people move on because you're still dealing with the tragedy of this terrible set of murders, correct? We, by July, we were dealing with that and still this idea of the boat wreck, you know, and, and what he was going through. I mean, you rally around your family and your friends. You rally around him, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and that's not to any way throw cold water on any of the claims of the, the people in the boat wreck, sure. but everybody he feels deserves it a too. defense. And, you know, you defend your, your friends and your family. Sure. And this is morally and honestly this is why creighton what slowing down matters because do, right? this witness keeps talking that's why you slow it down let him talk september 3rd or thereabouts annette finds this chris wilson check in alex's office right stop going september back to the, the checks second, we know september 2nd states 313 I can't, oh, sorry, I can't see that phone. Sorry. <laughs> Can relate. I can't see that far. He's like, which pocket are my readers in? I, I think this witness is in a difficult spot. Sure. A recess at this time. Please go to the jury room. Please do not discuss the case. I think this witness is in a difficult spot. Um, and I think he's I think he's doing a fair job with being in a difficult spot. Because again, his job here is to give testimony that's truthful and honest. He's not trying to throw anybody under the bus one way or the other. He's just trying to answer the questions that he's asked. And I think that's why um, there are times he comes across like, huh, really? But there's times he- not discuss your testimony. Yes, sir. I've been coming and going to the courtroom. I want to understand there's no order. This is court. We have our next two witnesses. We have our next two witnesses. We want to make sure we were ready to go as soon as this witness comes down. So if you see me coming and going, I'm just ensuring the witness is let in the front door and put somewhere. So I apologize. It's no disrespect to the court. How much more you have for this witness, do you think? 20 minutes, Your Honor. 20 minutes, then, then you don't know. So we don't know. Okay. Thank you. It'll be 10 minutes. <laughs> The judge is like, and we don't know. Um, so I again, I think this witness is in a tough spot. And look, I mean, I tried a lot of of driving under the influence cases, and a lot of driving under the influence cases related to death. Um, a lot of the defendants were not bad people. They weren't. They made really bad choices, um, and really bad choices that in some instances cause people to lose their lives. But it is, I know it's hard. It is a, 
it is a spectrum. And I think when we're talking about a, a young man that's been murdered, there's a spectrum of it. So giving grace to the witness saying, hey, I knew a good kid who made bad choices. The, the use of the word devilish was tough for me too. I get it. Um, but people are much more dynamic and, and people are dynamic. And so I don't think you can, you cannot, I don't think when you're looking at Paul Murdoch, you can ignore the boat case. I don't think you can absolutely ignore the boat case at all. But I also don't think it's the only thing about Paul Murdoch. And I think it's fair of this witness to talk about all aspects of it. And cases are dynamic. They really truly aren't one way or the other. And two things can be true at once. People can do and make horrible decisions. Um, and it's just not, not the entirety. It is complex. And humans are complex. The Bo case is so inextricably linked in this case, but there are still those that believe that Paul was not driving. I disagree, but we're looking at an entire community that trusted Alec Murdoch and trusted him. And I think this witness is grappling with what he was told, questioning his own beliefs, questioning the people that he know and, and questioning all of it. It's just it's much, much more complex. And this witness is grappling with all that in real time on an international stage. And it's awful. I truly think that the behavior of Alec Murdoch after the boat case is the most telling to him believing that Paul was driving in trying to cover it up. And I think that that behavior is, is absolutely app appalling. But the Murdoch family never seemed... Like they had any remorse over the boat accident at all. And I think that's part of the reason it's so hard to grapple with when talking about Paul as the murder victim in this case, because the family showed entitlement and privilege and trying to put it on someone else. And there's a lot of rage around that. I get it. There's a lot of rage around that because I have rage around that too. And this witness is grappling with that too. And so I think we're just watching how complex humans are in real time. And two things can be true at once. And we're watching two things being true at once playing out in this case. And I really do think that Alex's behavior after this boat wreck is, is absolutely appalling, but we see it with, with all kind with all kinds of people. Um, and so with all of that, thank you for giving grace, um, even when it's hard, because we're watching it play out in real time. And humans are complex. And witnesses are complex. Murders are complex. These victims are complex. No one is, if you take somebody's life and put it out on TV, no one's life is going to have moments that they're not ashamed of, embarrassed by, that they wish they could do over, that they wish they had done better. And that's all of us. Most of us hope that our lives don't end up playing out on a stage like this where they're breaking down every text message we've ever sent because we've been killed or because we're in a, a civil lawsuit. Um, like in Depp Be Heard, you saw it with Johnny Depp on the stand embarrassed about the text messages that he had sent. So it's just a difficult, again, a difficult and complex case. And it's okay to see all the different messiness in it and acknowledge it. But it's clear that Alec Murdoch thought that the rules didn't apply to him. And this witness said, quote, he was never really good at following the rules. That's not what it is. And this witness may not be able to see it because he's in this world with them. It's not that Alec Murdoch is not good at following the rules. Alec Murdoch doesn't believe that the rules apply to him. And the prosecution, I think, did a great job of artfully walking through the legacy of this family, how long they had been solicitors, how powerful this family was. So are we surprised by the behavior of Paul and Buster? I mean, if you listen to Buster and Alex 911 calls about Buster trying to get into law school, he's like, well, I know I got kicked out for cheating, but I'm only coming back if they meet my conditions. You're like, the fuck? 
Okay. Because they've lived in a multi-generational legacy where they think they can get away with everything. So I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that when the rules come calling for Alec, he might act wildly. The prosecution's not really putting that out there as their theory that accountability has never been something this family has done because the rules don't apply to them. He's not good at following the rules. He doesn't think those are his rules. I really think that Alec thinks he's like, you know, the master of the universe. Um, driving around with his law enforcement, I mean, DA badges, mine is sitting back there. They look like law enforcement badges. To flip it open and put it on the dash of your car and drive around as if you are law enforcement is some of the most fucking appalling shit. I shouldn't be surprised anymore, chat. Why am I still surprised about any of this? Why am I surprised about any of this? But I still am. I didn't ex I was trying to... Turn off the voice changer and I hit the wrong button there. I just... I shouldn't be surprised by any of this at all, but I still find myself sometimes surprised. And Chad, I appreciate you being here for, for having these conversations because that's one of the things cases put out so aptly is that people are messy. Our lives as people are messy. Our interactions with other people are messy. And we're looking at all of it. And I think that expecting, I don't know, expecting victims to have nothing in their, nothing in their past that is messy is just an unrealistic expectation. And it doesn't, again, two things can be true at once. It doesn't diminish that they're a victim. Um, but it also doesn't excuse some of the things in the past. Paul being a victim and Paul also being somebody who's criminally charged with the boating under the influence, killing one of his friends, are both true. And both can be true. But there aren't, we're all humans. Humans do awful things to each other. And it catches us in our life. And our lives are messy. And none of us are perfect. And we're not going to be. I think the best we can do is give grace to each other and hold those two th things true. I want healing and justice for Mallory Beach's family. And I don't know if maybe this case and talking about the boat crash and talking about all the things surrounding it, give her family some peace, knowing that people actually see behind the curtain and actually see what they were dealing with, what they were fighting the, the old boys club that they were fighting to get justice for their daughter. I hope it does. I don't know if it will, but I hope it brings them some peace. I don't think Mallory Beach's family ever wanted to see Paul Murdoch dead. I think they wanted to see him accountable. And those are two very different things. Um, and I think it's got to be hard for their family to watch people say that their family were suspects. They were, their DNA was taken. They were looked at as suspects in this. But to think that parents who have lost a child would take someone else's child is a difficult thing. Can it happen? Sure. But I don't think Mallory Beach's family um, is involved in these boat in the in these murders. I just don't. Um, and again, when you lay out the legacy of power of the Murdoch family, one of the things you have to look at is a comment that I see a lot. Who, who is coming for a family this powerful? that has been able to roll over everyone, including law enforcement in this area, who is coming for them if the call's not coming from within the house? So with all of that, that's what we heard this morning. I think this is a complex witness. I think the chat has complex, complex feelings about this witness. Some of it felt like he was too easy on Alex. Some of it felt like it was too a little too perfectly rehearsed. And some of it felt very raw. And I think all those things are probably true. Um, and so with all of it, this case continues to be an absolute mess. It's like all the things all at once. And yes, 
My hair is done today. Let's talk about that. We're going to answer some questions real quick before we get to, before we get to, uh, well, no, we're going to answer questions. I'm going to tell you about what's going on. Why is my hair done today is a, is a question. First of all, y'all broke, y'all broke my internet yesterday at lawnerdalert.com. Um, so many of you have signed up to stay in the loop and we're going to be looping you in weekly with our schedule. It is, I am going to be linking the YouTube videos so you can always find them and know when they will be coming out over on, on the email. I'm not going to blow up your email. I fucking hate it when people email me daily. I hate it. So I will not be blowing up your email. Um, but the, it crashed like three times yesterday. So if you go to Law Nerd Alert or I'm going to put the other link in here too, you will get a welcome email. We decided to add a discount for the Law Nerd Shop into that. So if you're sitting there this morning going, hey, I want my coffee and cursy words mug, we, we, because ADHD, decided yesterday to add that in. So everybody will be getting that. And everybody who has signed up will be getting that in their first uh, notification. So if you've signed up, you will absolutely get it. And we put those links in the chat. So lawnerdalert.com or emilydbaker slash lawnerdalert will get you there. Go ahead and sign up. We will keep you in the loop. It's a solution for our international crew. Um, Yippie asked, does my email get sold? No, I no, no, you're law nerds. This is so I can keep you in the loop because Google, the, YouTube doesn't always let you know when I'm going live. The text crew only works in North America. And even then it's really only US based. We have a large international audience. Not everyone has signed up on Patreon and they haven't rolled out a way where I can keep, um, keep you all in the loop. And we have been trying to find a way because it actually hurts my feelings when I see people in the chat going, damn it, YouTube didn't tell me you were live. I missed it. I'm like, I'm sorry. I feel bad. Truly feel bad. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't know what YouTube is doing. So because the notification system is, um, is not always perfect, we are trying to keep you in the loop because really I want you to be in the loop. So discounts for all the law nerds everywhere. Um, and I love the text alerts too, but they keep a lot of the law nerds um, out of the loop. And I don't want to keep any of the law nerds out of the loop. Do you ship to South Africa? Yes. There are very, very, very few countries we do not ship to. Um, we ship from within most countries, so you're not paying VAT taxes and things like that as well. So if you want to go over to lawnerdalert.com and sign up for your email, put in your name, put in your email. We will keep you in the loop. We promise we won't blow up your email. I do not sell emails. Our system is very locked down. Y'all are the law nerds. You're here for me. No one else needs access to your shit. It's to keep you in the loop. That's what it is. Um, so if it's down again, use the, because it keeps crashing as we hit it. Cause there's like 40,000 of us here. Um, I need to, I will message them over the lunch break. So, um, emilydbaker.com slash law nerd alert. It's in the chat. That one will get you there too. So if the redirect is not working, we'll go to the, we'll go to the base one. And that's in the chat, emilydbaker.com slash law nerd alert. We will figure out why the, the easier one to say is giving me shit. Because why wouldn't it? But if you can't do it now, give it a few minutes and try it again, and it will be there. Also, the reason my hair is down, I signed up uh, months and months and months ago to do kind of a year in review talk with the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Um, I enjoy, I always enjoy talking to the bar associations and other lawyers. It's still part of me being a professional in my field. But that is this afternoon. So here is the plan. This afternoon, I will have to peace out of our live stream. I will leave a feed up here. The mods will be here to chat with y'all. I will leave a feed up here so that with the feed up here, you can um, you can stay watching the trial with the chat and having a good chat. I don't want to send you elsewhere around the internet because I'll only be gone for like an hour. And if you are elsewhere around the internet, you can um, you can either come watch what I'm doing with the Beverly Hills Bar Association or watch trial or both. But I am just leaving the feed up with the mods and then hopping over to the Beverly Hills Bar Association. I will be over there for like an hour and then I will be back and I will put um, I will put that information in the link for the afternoon. So that is what's going on this afternoon. I will there will be a brief break where it will just be um, just be the court feed. So 
I see you guys asking if I can bring someone in. I I cannot today um, because, because of obligations I have with the Beverly Hills Bar Association. So I'm leaving, um, I'm leaving this up. So if it is broken, we will go, we will go pick. Um, does talking for the Bar Association count for CLE? For me, it does. And again, this trial was supposed to be done. So will the Beverly Hills Bar Association be recorded? Yes, it will stay up on YouTube. So don't worry about it. Um, it will be up on YouTube. So with that, it is time. It is time. It is time to answer some questions. What time this afternoon? Uh, 2.30 my time. Can Dr. B fill in? Uh, Dr. B is teaching this afternoon. So no, he will be he will be talking to the dental students. I will be talking to the lawyers. Um, so with that, we're going to get to some questions. Let's see. Christopher Chandler, 87 and sunny in Fort Myers today. Are you just taunting the law nerds that are buried under the snow? Maybe, maybe taunting. Good morning, law nerds and EDB, a.k.a. law mother. Hello. I think we are going to bring the jury. That is flashing, which I hate. He's talking to the witness to talk a little bit louder. Ashley asked from this morning, can the defendant yeah. sit there and take the fifth? No. If you take the stand, you have waived your Fifth Amendment right to take the stand. So no, you can't just take the fifth to parts because you waive it before you take the you stand. Bring the jury. All right. I'm going to keep answering questions while we bring the jury. I don't know what he's looking at on the stand. I think it's the check he just had. I wish I could sync up the audio from this feed and the audio from the other feed. The long crime audio is just dismal they've gained it up on their end i think so people can hear but the background noise is tough uh the defense will probably open the door for it anyway i mean that's a very good point we need closed captioning uh <laughs> i i go back and forth between the two feeds good wednesday morning good morning and i know that there are lots of especially within apple if you're on it you can turn on captioning on your end and your device can caption for you um, let's see. Um, Alec Murdoch regarding the financial, just to get him on the stand. I think if he gets on the stand, he has to talk about all of it. Why would they have Alex testify? The defendant has the absolute right. And he, you saw him in the other things saying, um, and yes, I'll put the link for the Beverly Hills Bar Association up in the afternoon feed. Uh, it's not this morning. I'll put it up after lunch. But you heard Alec tell me the other lawyers you. it's fine. I'll keep you talking. Please, Court, Your Honor. I think yes, he sir. thinks he can talk his way out of it if he testifies. All right. Um, I think uh, when we left off, I was showing you states, what is that, 313, I believe? Three. And uh, that's 313. That's the first check that was found in uh, the defendant's office that he had lied to everyone and told that uh, he never received. They're just going back to the this checks. This is the first one. One of them, at least, correct? One, one of them, the first one that we knew of. Right. And then <clears throat> we're around September 2nd or something like that, and uh, around that same time, Jeannie starts printing, uh, researching in y'all's system, Forge, <gasps> and finds all the fake Forge checks. Is that right? She, my she used the, the query Stones. Forge to see whether anything had been put into a, an annuity, any fees had been moved or, or put under an annuity, and... A list came out of, I don't know, 10 or 12 different cases. And y'all called the real Forge and said, y'all have any of these clients? And they said, no. Y'all ever banked a Bank of America? They said, no. We did, but in that list, like the fourth or fifth one was a client that I was representing, and the money was to be held in trust. And when we pulled up the documents, supporting documents, it had a notation on it that it was a uh, invested for three years, which I knew couldn't be, so I went and called the client. The client verified that he hadn't authorized anything, hadn't done anything, and I immediately told him that his funds would be put back in there. And I walked back across the street to Jeannie's office and told him we had a big problem. And that was Thomas Moore, correct? That was Tommy Moore. Yeah. That was a highway patrolman had been injured, correct? Correct. And Alex stole his money. He did. And they had been friends, to your knowledge? As far as I, I, 
acquaintances, friends. I'm not sure what the relationship. And I'm not going to go through in great detail because it's already been done. But generally, you and Jeannie were probably the main drivers of the investigation into all of this theft in states 314. This is who Jeannie trusted and went all of to. All were involved, but I was with Jeannie. A this is who Jeannie trusted to not. I, I was with her. Uh, vast amount of the time going retaliate against her I think checking to see right. and ultimately you had to reach out and talk to a lot of these clients clients of Alec Murdoch's right I did what was that like and you had to tell them what had happened I, I did including two weeks ago or three weeks ago another one and you had to tell them that Alec had lied to them, right? I did. And they said, Alec lied to me. He never told me that, correct? Yeah. Response? I'll move on. You had conversations with all those clients, the clients that you dealt with, right? I dealt with the majority of them, yes. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 314. Just real quick. Go Too many checks. And, uh, just don't have to go into anything more, but just list the names of people that you had to deal with personally over what he had done. Well, I was involved with the, the one for Barrett Bowler with, with Ronnie. All right, let's talk about Barrett for a second. That was one of his close friends, right? He was. And can you describe the money that he stole what? from Barrett? Barrett had had a... Um, fire on a piece of property that he had and it burned down the house and there were proceeds for cleaning up and then there were proceeds for uh, so these are the victims of the financial sundry, crimes um, things that were associated as well as the structure and we started looking at it and figured out that the, the $75,000 had been stolen and then later on that there was an additional amount that never went through there. How much was that additional amount? 279000 according to this exhibit number. That was a close friend of his, correct? I would, say, I would say that was one of his closest friends. One of his closest friends. That's who he ended up getting Moselle from. And when he stole that $75,000 from Barrett where Barrett was sick and needed that money to put his wife up in a hotel near the hospital he was at, didn't he? Barrett, Barrett was dying of colon cancer, yes. And needed that money, and Alex stole it anyway, right? I assume he needed the money. He stole money from a friend who was dying of colon cancer? All right, keep going. This, again, That's why they're going um, through these. The next one down is Jacob, the estate of Jacob Hershberger. And at first... Again, we, I, we don't need to give him each one, but that's one of them that you had to deal with? That's that one that I just dealt with yeah. two weeks ago, and we're still straightening it out. Right. But you had, the firm had to straighten it out and, and deal with the money because he took it, correct? We are now. We're in the process of it. After talking with the clients and everybody else involved, right? Correct. All right, go on to the next one, please. Um, Mr. You want me to give the names or? Yeah, just, just give Mr. Them. Anderson, I dealt with. Dion They're already Martin, in the record. His family, I dealt with. All right, let me let me slow you down. So Christopher Anderson, you said that's somebody you had to talk to yourself. Yes, sir. And y'all had to, the firm had to pay money for what he did, correct? Yes, sir. Dion Martin was somebody you talked to yourself. I, I did, and along with then, his parents. Been horribly injured in an accident. He had a brain injury, correct? And had a brain injury. Yes, sir. And you had to talk to him about the defendant lying to him with his brain injury, correct? And, and his parents. And his parents and taking his money, correct? Correct. All right, keep going. Um, Elise Mallory. Elise um, Mallory, and she had a relative who died, correct? She, she did, and I had represented. Very sweet old lady, have you met her? Well, Elise. Is, That's what I mean. She, she's not really Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, um, the person that you dealt with, the, the personal representative. And then, um, is she a very sweet, nice lady? The PR? Yeah. In that case? All, all, I haven't had a single one of these clients that weren't nice people. Very nice people. Super nice people. And, and he took advantage of each one of them and lied to them, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Tell me some more now. Uh, the Risher case, I, I wasn't involved in it. Johnny Bush, I dealt with him. I talked with J.J. Jinks. Um, to your knowledge, Johnny Bush considered himself a friend of Alec Murdoch's? I don't know whether they were friends, but they were good acquaintances. 
Um, Johnny was a little bit different. He overcharged him on, or gave him the impression that it was the ninety-five thousand dollars was for expenses, and it was right. not. So he lied and told him that there were expenses that had to be paid, and instead Alec Murdoch stole that money from his good acquaintance Johnny Bush. Correct? That's correct. Keep going. Uh, JJ Jinks, he, I talked with JJ, but I didn't deal with the the paying him back part of it. But y'all, uh, the firm still had to pay him back for the lies that Alec Murdoch told, correct? And for the theft. Correct. Sorry, that was me. Keep going. If you I didn't mean to turn it down. The Christiani matter is still ongoing. But I did Keep by accident. Quick, and then Randy Drawdy, um, that matter's over. Tommy Moore, I've dealt with him. His money's back in trust uh, where it's supposed to be. Right. Tommy Moore was a highway patrolman that got injured in the line of duty, correct? He, he was. And Alec lied to him and took his money, correct? Correct. He's this, in the this HBO is not special? All of them either. So that's the ones for now, correct? That's the ones that are on that list that's been admitted to evidence here, correct? Correct, but there's a good many more than this. Okay. A good many more than this. Somebody tell me why the defense chose this witness again. Somebody's phone sounds like it's Are buzzing. Are you aware in your conversations with the defendant that back around town of the recession that he had gotten into some land deals that had gotten him some financial issues? Creighton's real excited for this cross. Yes. And then not long after that, he had some big cases, such as the Arthur Badger case and the Pinckney UPS case and Good the Plyler case, in which yep. he got a large amount of fees from very large recoveries, correct? Badger was the UPS. Pinckney was the tire case. Okay. But, yeah, he got very big fees. All right. And you thought that with all those fees that you knew who you got because he's your partner and you get to see the books. You're the treasurer of the firm or, or have been for an extended period, is that correct? For the old firm, yes. And you thought that the money that he legitimately got from those cases had solved those problems because it was a lot, wasn't it? I think I, along with everybody else, thought that he, had, he was totally out of any debt but on to top, speak of. But you've come to find out on top of the fees that he got, he also stole millions from those clients, correct? Yes, sir. Octavia, we it do. It wasn't enough for him, was it? Chip to Romania. Clearly not. I'm almost done. Freckled Joy, this is the flip side of the financial crimes. Is it Going back to also that gives a lot of people who could be angry at him? To. A lot of people. You didn't see any blood on Alec Murdoch that night, did you? No, sir. And when you went back the next day, you went back because y'all had attempted to call, y'all had called the coroner to get the names, and he had given you the names of some companies that, that their job is to come out and help clean up scenes like this, correct? That's correct. And y'all had called them, but nobody called back, and you just felt like you had to do something, so you went to the scene. Is that right? Well, we were trying to also Clean see up. What, what we could find out, if there was anything that we could do to Did you not trust SLED to do their investigation, I mean, sir? Something that was, I mean, everything stopped. Everything stopped. The whole world did. And being a friend like people would be and just trying to do whatever you could, correct? Friend and, you know, we were... And we're lawyers. lawyers. We, lawyers. you know, we try to figure out what happened to things. Oh, lawyers do and like you to went solve problems. In that feed room and Evil or not things asked. that you saw. I did. And you also ended up getting blood on your sleeves, correct? I, I did. I didn't up, know. Up it high, high, correct? On my shoulder areas and on my pants. So he couldn't even go into the scene without getting blood on him. That's a good question. I asked you a little bit about the defendant's cell phone use. Was it like him to have very short phone calls, or was he one to talk for a while? Uh, I mean, he he would cut you off with one phone call coming in on top of another. He'd call you about something and say, oh, I'll call you back, and 
click it off and you know. But he'd start talking about something, right? Yeah, but I mean, he would. He would. It was regular. It was regular. Short phone calls were regular. He would typically talk for more than a minute, though. Mm, he's not that, saying I that. I assume so. I mean, most people, a minute is not not much of a conversation. It's not much of a conversation just for a minute, is it? No. The night of the murders, did you see a golf cart up at the Moselle residence? I saw one in front of their house. In front of the house? Yeah, if you drove up the driveway, it was over to the left. <clears throat> it was parked in front of the house? It was parked off to the left side of the house. <clears throat> Going back to September. Y'all, I see the comments about leading. This is cross-examination. It's allowed to be leading. Forge, and y'all have a meeting of partners without Alec there and without Randy there, correct? Well, first of all, on the second, which was Thursday, right? when the stuff with Forge came up and you started looking down, when I made the phone call to Tommy Moore, right. and we was, first thing Jeannie did was start grabbing our check. All we could see was our end of it. So if a check was written, off of our trust account or our operating account, but these were mostly trust checks. If it was written off a trust account, we could get a copy of our check. We didn't know where it had gone from there, and we could see the disbursement sheets, and we could tell where they were deposited by looking at the back of the check, which you don't normally do. I mean, it's just not, and when you started seeing commonality to it, and then but the, the more thing, was concrete. I mean, there was just no way that money couldn't have been written out because it was being held. He had an ongoing workers' right. comp claim that that was a statutory lien. You couldn't couldn't give him the money. And Bottom line is, without rehashing the whole story for the jury again, y'all knew he had been stealing at that point. That's when we found out, and then I met. Didn't know how much. In fact, you found out a whole lot later, correct? A whole lot. We had about six at that time. <laughs> I met with our president that night and Ronnie Crosby and set up a meeting for the next morning and it was an emergency met, and then Randy was tied up and then came and at that point it was unanimous and then Randy and Danny went and talked to him All right. and then when confronted he admitted with that, that and he was forced to oh, resign Danny so was the lawyer that was in the well, car he could either resign that's right not this or one be terminated but it was 32nd decision and what day was that when that happened? That was Friday. What day? Do you remember? Uh, that would have been September the 3rd. 3rd. And we immediately started the end of all the things you have to do when you find out that a lawyer's been stealing in your firm. It's a lot of stuff to do. Which has been absolute teetotal pure hell since then. <laughs> so everything was coming home to roost. That's a phrase. The storm was arriving again for Alec on September 3rd when y'all confronted him. Is that correct? Teetotal pure yes. hell. Yeah. Yes, sir. It was over. And then on That's September funny. 4th, what happened? What did you hear about? Uh, I had, had um, spoken to uh, Mr. Griffin just to let him know that we had terminated him. He already knew. And about... 11, 30, 12 o'clock, whatever time it was, I was on a tractor, and he called me and said, you're not going to believe what happened. And I thought, my first response was, don't tell me that jackass killed himself. Right. And he said, no, somebody shot him. And I just said, I don't believe that. You bullshit. don't believe that. A lot of people thought he right away, oh my gosh, the real killers are back. Correct? The chickens were home to roost again for Alec, and all of a sudden he's a victim again, correct? What was the objection? The objection is overruled. Every time he gets scene, overruled, he laughs. I to the scene, but I didn't, I didn't believe it. You didn't believe it? Because no. you have training as a lawyer, right? I don't know whether it was intuition, training, whatever. I just didn't believe it. And what did you see at the scene that confirmed well, that this well, time? I got and out. It didn't work. Danny and Lonnie were there and standing there, and I said, I don't, I don't buy it. And we walked up towards the car. I think I said it's got run flat tires and the tire's not flat. Before we got to it, Ronnie said it doesn't even have a spare. 
And then when we got up to it's it, it's run flat. You could see at nine o'clock where somebody had stabbed the tire. And we stung, we hung around there, and then when Sled showed up, I think it was actually David Owens showed up or Ryan. But Creighton's never going to end this cross. Kelly He's having so much fun. Them, and that's when we told him we had fired him the day before. And that's when it all what had happened. We were in consultation with with a lawyer we had to hire on Friday to figure out what to do and how to do it. And when this happened, we thought they needed to know. Yep. And you were told that Alec claimed at the scene that he was shot by some unknown assailant, correct? Uh, that's that was the story. Uh, but you just, knew this scene had been manufactured by Alec, correct? When you arrived there, I, I didn't know that. I just I suspected. It just didn't look like. He didn't believe. I mean, it was a shiny Mercedes black car with no holes in it, a single shot. There's the back hatch didn't open. Nobody stole the There's car. No, no nothing. I mean, it just doesn't look right. And nobody took the car. If you're going to shoot him, take the car. And just right? when accountability is arriving run flat. again, the defendant oh, that's manufactures himself being a victim. Correct. That's what it turned out to be. Okay. Nobody objected. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Wow, he stopped. Redirect. Briefly, Your Honor. It'll be interesting to see how Jim cleans that up because this, prosec Ball, uh, this prosecution made a lot out of that cross examination. The law firm, PMPED, repaid all the money to the clients and that's owed, as well as insurance company that pitched in? Uh, to this point, we still have, we're holding some money as of a week, two weeks ago, and in one of the matters, we're still, it, we're trying to get that money returned. We're having to go through a PR. And the, the list of names that you, you read off. Personal representative, nobody folks, talks about it, but that's what it is. If, if, if they were entitled to the money now, they, they've received it? Is that right? The people on that list have, yes, and there's plenty, a bunch more that have as well. And, and the law firm is currently out a lot of money. Is that correct? We are. As a result of Alex. Well, the law, the law firm and the, the partners in the law firm. The partners yeah. personally. We've had to pony it out of our pocket. Sure. You personally have had to pony up. Yes, sir, along with my partners. And, um, and when, when Alec was resigned or terminated in September, um, he had some cash flow coming into the firm that the firm was able to keep and use that to pay some of the claims? No, sir. Uh, all of our funds, doesn't matter what I earn until it's declared at the end of the year, it's law firm money. No, I understand that. So law firm money earned off Alex cases that was the firm money when he left? Well, we're talking a couple of million dollars? For, first of all, all the cases are owned by the law firm. They're not right. They're not Mark's his. cases. They're not Alex cases. They're law firm cases. M cases that Alec was working on generated monies, and, and we internally decided how we were going the formula that we were going to use because people had to complete those cases. And we've allocated much, much more than ordinarily our expenses are taken out in a different way, but we allocated a bunch of money to pay in those, yes. I understand. But, um, but the income from those cases, north of $2 million, perhaps? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And in your firm and Jeannie Seconder and others have cooperated with SLED and the Attorney General's Office in their investigation of Alex misdeeds in relation to those client matters, have they not? We have. I think Jim's trying and to point out that Alex been that this has been resolved. Aware that Alex has like they don't need to the jury doesn't need to fix this. Financial. The stuff you just testified about, right? Yes, sir. And you've been subpoenaed here today to testify in the murder case, correct? I've been subpoenaed since this trial started. And you know this is the murder case. Yes, sir. No, ask that question to Creighton. Not this now, witness. Immediately after the murder um, a Maggie it's a Paul, question. And you talked about Alex's demeanor. Uh, did he come to work and was able to work on cases? No, sir. He, he came, he was out for a while. He 
I think he went to his in-laws and stayed. He didn't, uh, it, it, after the funeral, the funeral was either Friday or Saturday, I can't remember, and then Randolph's was, Randolph died on Thursday after this, and then Randolph's was on Sunday, and Alex sort of, he was staying between Randy, John Marvin, and whoever else, his mother's house. I think he went to his in-laws. First, the angel said this guy's a talker. To, he is a lawyer. To, um, Most of us like to talk his brother -in -law a lot, and sister -in -law. Sure. for better or for worse. And, uh, but no, he was not. There was a period of time he wasn't, wasn't doing it. He would, might come by eggs this morning. and he would Egg be bites. in his office generally looking at sympathy notes. And, and from your observation, was he in any frame of mind to do any productive legal work the month of June? Oh, no. no. The month of July? Uh, we sat down and talked about it as partners and not with Alec about what we were going to do because there's deadlines and things that have to be done. And so we were going to try to figure out how we were going to delicately right. kind of start stepping in on some of his cases and making sure everything was being done according to what needed to be. And, uh, and I, I, I think you testified about how the firm, partners in the firm, lawyers in the firms were reaching out and using your resources to try to find out perhaps who played a role in killing Maggie and Paul. We absolutely were. And, uh, and, and but were you careful not to go out and do the investigation yourself and just relay the information back to SLED? Right. I mean, we weren't trying to be privatized or any of that. We were just trying well. to see. And we relayed, I relayed numerous things to the various officers. And I would preface it by, I don't know whether this means anything. But and you never know. I mean. And was, to your knowledge, was information being relayed through Alex attorneys to pass on SLED? Well, I, I know I dealt with you on various things up until the, the stealing. Sure. And to your knowledge, was Alex consenting and cooperating with SLED in their investigation? As far as I knew, yes. I mean, I, I, I wasn't with him during those interviews or anything else, but as far as I knew he was, and I would ask him, you know, where we stand, you know, if you well, heard Well, Jim, anything, unlike you. you know, I wasn't and, that involved. Um, were you aware that Alex Buster put up a reward? I, I was. And are you also aware that when Paul was criminally charged in the voting case, Alec came under criticism for interfering in the investigation? You remember that? I, I was. And, and in fact, been some pretty public allegations about that about Alex that were had surfaced before Maggie and Paul had been murdered. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were criticizing him for advising people of stuff. But I'm a lawyer. I'm a parent, daddy. One of my kids has some problem or gets accused of something, or one of my friend's kids. I'm going to put my lawyer hat on and advise them to be quiet until their parents get there and. Uh, I think counsel, it went beyond if, that. If I think though. it's a serious matter. Sure. Um, you were uh, asked about Alec cell phone use and, and and about whether he would take the phone down to the kennel. Have you ever been down to the kennels with Alec? Yeah. Okay. Have you been the, riding the property with? Are they going to start? I, I have. Not Are they going to start fighting lot. over who's the better I mean, friend, Jim? As time you, went on. You ride this property with our him. Our family's got older, and you just. When you don't have children, it's you, you, you're doing a lot more things together on the weekends and stuff. And as your children get older and they're in college, and he was going to Walford and different places where Buster was, and sure. you know your interests are different as well. But yeah, I, I would occasionally, or if he was building something, he might ask me what I thought about it or show me something. I mean, I saw his duck pond and you know rode around the property several times. Was cell phone coverage spotty down at the shed in the tunnel? It, it, it can be. It, it varies. I mean, it it can be. Um, I, I don't remember specifically where and what. You know, I didn't. I, out where I live, if I go in my house with a metal roof, 
This morning, somebody was trying to talk to me, and I had to walk out on the porch. Other days, I, I don't have a metal roof in my house. I live eight miles, nine miles from where this place is, and I don't know whether it's a metal roof or whether I'm just at the end of of wherever a cell tower is. But it, out in my area, which is Rome Gully, sure. uh, it can. Jim's point it can is, be it's not Alex's fault if there's and no cell and reception. And he did not have his phone. It wasn't sus. It was just poor cell reception. And, and they're blaming Verizon. They're like, we can't hear you now. Before Alec got Moselle, you, you have a farm. I do. And would Alec bring the boys over to hunt on your property? Mostly Paul. Mostly Paul. Yeah, I mean, it, Buster would come some, but Buster was older, and, and then obviously when Buster started college, he, he wasn't around as much. But Paul was a very avid hunter and was over at either my place or Ronnie's place a lot. And, and he and Alec were together a lot doing that? Paul. He and Alec, I mean, excuse me, he and Paul, Alec and Paul together a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and Paul was with his grandfather a lot. And I think you mentioned that um, Paul would leave stuff over there? Uh, all three of them, but, you know, uh, they, they would just, they'd leave a gun, they'd leave a coat, they'd leave a flashlight, maybe all three. And it was just sort of a running joke that they, you had to kind of go around and gather up their stuff after they left. And that was just them. And did you remember one time Paul left a gun over there for a couple of months? He, he did. And I, Alec left one one time, I believe. And <laughs> I He's like, it well, and put it up and they all do. He started asking around where his gun was and, you know, we just sort of played with him a little bit and then gave it back to him. Right. Um, I think you, you testified moving September the 4th. You had uh, gotten word about a shooting bombing Alec, and you know, I think your words were that jackass had killed himself. Uh, that was what I yep. thought immediately. And why That's did exactly you think? what he said. Uh, because of all that had gone on. We had terminated him, or he had resigned the day before. This financial stuff was starting to come out, and you know, I thought, you know, he lost two family members, and now he's now he's got no job, and you know, it it, it seemed feasible. I, I mean, I had been concerned about him, his mental health, from the time of the murders up until right. then. In fact, I had suggested that he go see somebody for grief counseling for. I mean, we were all grieving their loss, and, and you know, I, it's one of those deals that you just, you can tell when somebody's not hitting on all cylinders, and he obviously was, I would come by his office and he would be crying. I mean, or I would ask him something, I remember him asking me one time when he was going through his, he had a stack of sympathy cards, and he said, should I send them all back a note? And I said, Alec, yeah, like people don't send you sympathy cards Expecting to, a note. you know, get a, a note back from you. There's no way in the world you can do that. And he when, was, um, he said he, he was terminated from the firm and, and you were concerned about perhaps what he might do. Did you ever think maybe he'll go kill a family member? Huh. Did that ever cross your mind? No, no. You're talking about when we terminated him? Yes. Sir. By then, by then, Maggie and Paul. This had is been dangerous killed. territory. Um, well, he had family out he, there. He, he, he did. I, I never thought of any of that. Uh, listen, when when September the second hit, it changed everything that I knew about Alec. I, I would have never believed that a guy that uh, you know was like family would have ever stolen from me, would have stolen from his family, would have stolen from his clients or any of that. And so immediately you're, you're, you've got this rage, this emotion that you've got. And then on the third, we go through this whole ordeal of the termination and then the fourth it hits and you're like, you know, did the jackass kill himself because of anything else? And then as time progressed on and you see the, the scope of it, I mean, I don't know the guy that 
after September the 3rd and leading out, I don't know who that guy is. I mean, that's not Alec that I knew right. and Alec that I loved and Alec that all of us loved. You know, not did he have person. imperfections? You bet. Did yeah. he do things that aggravated the hell out of me? You bet. But you, you don't kick your brother out the door because, you know, they snore at night or, or you know, they've done things that aggravate you. You get past it. Sorry, y'all. But when they do things that are criminal uh. and they do things that affect not only him, but he's torn down an entire legacy, a law firm. Yep. I've spent 34 years or 33 years, I guess, in this one place. It's the only law firm that I've ever worked at. I put everything in it. It's all my children have known, my family's known, and it's gone. We had to change the name. We've had to do all these things because of Still his passed. acts on this financial stuff. Right. And, and when it comes to that, Let him talk. I'm mad as hell. I mean, I, you, you just don't know how mad I am. But on the other hand, I'm not saying that because he did that, he's done what he's accused of. And so that's, you know, that's, that's sort of the bottom line of it. His, his actions that, I mean, he was doing that way back, but we never knew it. Sure. And, and when we found out about it, it makes you doubt everything, and it's just human nature. But I don't have one shred of anything. All I can do is just point to what I saw. And, That's and fair. you pointed to the roadside shooting and what you saw, you thought he, that jackass tried to kill himself. Absolutely. And it may not, I may not have said jackass, but it's about as and large church as I want to give you. It made sense why he would want to kill himself in that moment. Sure. I mean, he lost, as far as I was concerned, he'd lost everything. He'd lost his job and he'd lost, forget the job, forget the money, forget what's going to happen to him. He lost his wife and his child. And, and are you aware that he had $12 million of life insurance? I didn't know what he had. I assumed he had some life insurance, but no, I mean, I didn't, I never had that conversation with him. And I, quite frankly, I, I, I'd have to see it to really believe it. <laughs> Thank you. That's all the questions. He doesn't believe anything. Creighton, take a deep breath, buddy. This guy's been a Pretty very close. interesting witness with points for both sides because this trial, everything you goes said that What you know now about this man who'd been your partner and friend for 34 years causes you to question everything you thought you knew about him. Isn't that right? It does. You were asked about all those clients that had to be repaid money, and none of that money came from him, did it? No, sir. Y'all had to pay that money, right? We I did. don't know if this helps How you, Brayton. I would say, at this point, probably north of 10 or $11 million. Now, insurance paid for some of that, but I mean, there's been a substantial chunk of that that came out of our pocket. You were asked about Alec having some cases that were coming in. But you explain, though, that this is June, and that disbursement's not going to come to him until December. He's not going to be able to get that money until December, correct? Any, any of what he's entitled to, which isn't all of it, correct? Huh. Because it good belongs point. to the firm. It's a good right. point. Right. Everything Creighton. belongs to the firm until the end of the year when you meet, and then you divide up money and. And that's why he stole the Ferris fee fees in March, because he needed the money right then. I would assume so. I mean, the. The, the money was gone. Oh, yeah, the bell's tolling Q. Do, do you checks. really know? He already answered it, though. You said that in the month after the murders, he wasn't really working on cases, but he sure managed to arrange to cover those Ferris fees to pay him back so that everyone would forget about it, didn't he? Or not all of it. That's a fair point. He managed to do that, didn't he? Yeah, well, part of it. I mean, there, I think there was $192,000 that didn't. That he convinced Chris Wilson to cover for him convinced or Chris had to cover it, one of the two. I think Chris had to cover it because of his license. I think that's a fair point, too. I think Creighton should stop, but he can't help himself. Don't lose the forest for the trees, Creighton. Law enforcement and the murders. But he never told 
law enforcement that he was down at the kennels just minutes with the victims before they died. He never told law enforcement that, did he? Yeah. He's heard all the testimony. Do you know? I think it's responsive to uh, redirect him. Go with do you know. Testify if you know. I don't know what he told law enforcement other than what's been out there in the public. Well, let me ask you this. He denied to you three times that he ever went to those kennels, did he not? He did. His buddy, his friend, and his law partner his of 34 years told you brother. three times, I was never there. That's, that's and, correct. And you okay, know great, stop. now that's a lie. When I saw the we know he lies. video a month or so ago, Thank you, Mr. Ball. Thank you, Creighton. I step down. Thank I don't think, I think everyone in this chat is convinced, convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Alec Murdoch lies. Next witness. Convinced. Uh, you're on a calls Dawes Cook. Wait, wait, who are you? Dawes Cook. Dawes Cook. It looks like we have another defense attorney who's going to be asking questions. Dawes? D A W S? Dawes Cook? He's got a folder. Oh! I've, I've rarely seen this defense attorney sitting over there this trial because she's all the way on the end. Nothing but the truth, so help you die. I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have a seat up on the witness stand. Please pull that microphone to you and adjust it so that the sheer height that you can talk into it. You'll state your name and spell your last name. It's uh, Morris Dawes Cook, Jr., and Cook is C-O-O-K-E. Thank you. Would you please tell the jury a little bit about yourself? I'm a lawyer. I practice in Charleston, South Carolina, with uh, Fern Barnwell, Whaley, Patterson, and Helms. I've been doing it since graduated from law school in 1979. I clerked for a judge for a year, and I've been with the same you law firm since wow. 1980. And I practice mainly civil litigation. And do you primarily represent plaintiffs or defendants? Uh, I don't mind representing plaintiffs, but most of the time I'm representing defendants. All right. And do you know Alex Murdoch? I do. How do you know him? Uh, through practice of law. I had cases against him over the years. Okay. And have you represented him before? No. Well, I'm, I mean, now I do, but I did not previously <laughs> right. to this, right? Right. What do you represent him uh, for? And um, what was the scope of your representation? Uh, I'm, I'm defending him in the boat accident case. Uh, okay. Um, and when were you asked to join his team? Uh, in December of <laughs> this is 2020, I got a call from Danny Henderson and asked me if I would uh, become involved. The case was already had already been going on for a year and a half or so at that time. Okay. And did he have other attorneys representing him at that time? Yes. Yeah, the, the Hainsworth firm, John Tiller in particular, um, was representing him. Okay. And what, if any, understanding do you have as to why you were asked to join the defense team? <clears throat> well, John was, uh, was sick, as I think everybody knows now, and uh, uh, would be undergoing treatment from time to time, and he was unsure as to uh, whether he'd be able to cover everything by himself. And so I was asked, one, to help him uh, sort of be a second chair for him and also uh, be a backup. This uh, would have been privilege waived, not be able to, which is interesting. Uh, okay. And would you please describe for the jury uh, your assessment of the merits of the claim against Alex in June of 2021? Uh, okay, I mean, well, it calls I for a legal conclusion. The they brought the lawyer. Negligent parenting that uh, Mark mentioned during his, his testimony. Uh, the claim at that time was that Alec was responsible for the boat accident because he knew that Paul was using his brother's ID. And um, I, mean, I didn't think that there was a claim in South Carolina law for that. So. I sort of facetiously called it negligent parenting. So uh, we felt Headed that it mock, was a defensible claim. Mock Mark Tinsley, um, who's I, I sitting in the audience. I always felt that lurking out there was going to be the, what's, what's now uh, negligent entrustment, that eventually they would allege negligence for having um, let him use the boat, which yep. is the substance of the claim now. 
But even that, we, we always felt like it was a defensible claim. That uh, you know, I think the, the big picture that, that occurred to me was uh, uh, to hold him liable for that would be to hold him to a higher standard than any of the other parents of, of the other folks that were in the, in the boat, which okay. anybody who's raised kids knows that um, that can be difficult. Um, and what was your assessment as to Alex's financial exposure as a result of this case in June of 2021? Well, it was it was it was unknown, and I'll have to say that was I, I, I didn't even really pay attention to that issue at the time. I think there was still a declaratory judgment action pending that was going to decide whether there was some additional insurance. Uh, I knew that the, the the one policy was relatively limited, um, so. Uh, I wouldn't have said that he had no personal exposure, but that was certainly not the focus of our attention at that time. Right. And were there motions pending when you joined the case? Yes, uh, several motions pending. Uh, for some time, there had been a motion by Parker's to change venue. Parker's is the uh, liquor out of Hampton, store, convenience in store. Beaufort County. And there was also, uh, they had made a motion to amend their answer to uh, plead admiralty uh, law, which would have some benefits over South Carolina law for the defense. And then there was this, uh, there was uh, I didn't have admiralty have law on my bingo card. I discovery with Parker's. I, I don't really remember. Daryl Brooks would be thrilled that admiralty law has entered this criminal case. Of 2020, uh, there had been a motion to compel the answers to interrogatories and motion and request to produce uh, to Alec. And have you reviewed that motion to compel? Yes. Okay. I'm going to. Oh, the background noise. Yeah, it is um, plaintiff's exhibit. Not plaintiff, I'm sorry. State's exhibit 402. Yeah, Admiralty Law. Admiralty Law. We are now in Parker's arguing Admiralty Law. Brooks is going to be like, I knew it could happen. I knew it could happen. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, can you great. get Admiralty um, Law on waterways that are not the page, ocean? You recognize this I don't know the answer to that question. That's the motion. And then okay. I think attached to that were can you do that? two sets of interrogatories and a set of requests to produce. I've dealt with Admiralty Law a little bit as a research attorney, but oh, a real long time ago. Uh, interrogatories. Um, would you just briefly explain to the jury what interrogatories and requests for production are? Right. Well, we call it discovery. Uh, the rules of civil procedure provide various means of obtaining information from the other side. So interrogatories is questions that you can ask and then request to produce our sworn uh, documents and other materials that you can require be provided. Sworn the answers ones that we're to looking questions. At right here. Um, were they seeking financial information, Mr. Murdoch? Yes. Okay. And um, the objections, if you'll look, the answers right here to the interrogatories and then the objection right here. Have you reviewed those? Yes. Yeah, okay. Catherine, that's what I and thought you had to be out. Objections? It has right, to be uh, off the this coast, This was done right? before I was involved in the case, but those are the, the exact objections I that I so would have too. made. Um, this, these financial The Coast Guard did show up to the accident, that's It's fair. sort of the plaintiff's lawyer's way of saying I'm really serious and I'll call it intimidation, not in a, not in a pejorative way, but it's, it's meant to right. really worry the defendants, and it's very common um, and that's the all civil practice is from the defendant would be just no like disrespect this, to the is, civil lawyers um, we object it's not relevant you haven't gotten a judgment but a against lot of us. it is you suck uh, you no, don't you need suck. to know how much money we have uh, pushing between until, the two sides unless and until you do get a judgment the comeback to that is well if your net worth could be relevant on punitive damages if it goes to the jury um, a jury could consider your wealth as a factor in awarding punitive damages and so 95% of the time you work out some agreement to provide a financial statement, uh, but I would never have produced all of these details at this stage of litigation as a defense lawyer. And that's the point um, after of this testimony. That Tinsley was after, asking uh, for all this stuff, the but that you have it wasn't really a gathering storm the way it was said. That's yes, the point. Yes, right, regularly. Um, and. I have to admit, there's a lot I didn't remember, so I've gone back and I've looked at my emails, my time records, and 
we defense lawyers, we, we, we measure our lives in tenth of an hour increments, and we have to write everything down. So it was helpful for me to go back and yep. look through my time records as well as emails to see who this all is why I never. But, uh, this is why yes. I do not like okay. civil practice. Alex often um, in CC on the emails? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Did you ever participate in any Zoom meetings with the defense team? Yes. Um, the, the one I... Well, there's, there, there's more than one, but the, one I, the first one I remember was April 15 of 2021. Um, I was just sort of getting involved. I don't think I'd made a formal appearance in the case yet, but there was a Zoom conference. Um, and I, I remember Alec was included on the Zoom invitation, but I honestly can't recall whether he was in the meeting okay. itself. I, I, I remember others who were in the meeting. And what was the purpose of that Zoom call? It was, it was really to kind of orient me, and also there were some motions scheduled in May. Uh, so it was just to, to, to get me oriented, uh, talk about what the important issues in the case were and the things that we'd be focusing on. Okay. Um, and having attended that meeting, um, what, if any, understanding did you have as to the biggest issues facing Alex at the upcoming motions hearing? Right. I, I, I had to go back and look at my notes to refresh my memory on that. But it was the, the upcoming, as far as I was concerned, it was the venue issue, whether the case was going to be transferred back to Beaufort, because we didn't want it transferred back. Uh, we wanted it to stay in Hampton. Um, we thought that the plaintiff wanted it to stay there, too, but he was wavering, and uh, there was some thought that he might consent, and we didn't want him to consent. So that was a big issue. And then we spent a lot of time talking about admiralty. Uh, you know, was it beneficial to have admiralty as opposed to state common law? Um, so that was, that, as far as the hearing, that was the important part of the conversation. That was about a two Lawyers. hour uh, meeting, and we talked a lot about experts, depositions that needed to be taken, and so forth as well. And after that meeting, um, based on those conversations, I like this attorney's questioning style. What, if it feels so calm. Do you have as to the level of concern that and concise team had regarding and the clear? The I mean, I mean, really, we're none. just um, walking through. I wasn't dealing with Mark directly on that. Whether John the jury Zeller gives a shit it, at this point about as far this, as we were concerned, we don't know. That was something that they were going to work nice out. But the and focus on the hearing was going to be on these these other substantive issues. We are back Did in the weeds a little bit, but it's important for the defense to argue in closing. Granted in total, no, in total. Not pacing. What, what's the question? If, if he personally had an un, expected the motion to compel to be granted. I'll say 401, 402. No, I think it's fair. You all asked Tinsley. Objection. Really? You all asked Tinsley about it. Um, when were when was the motion? I think that should have been that should have been heard. overruled. They asked Mark Tinsley it was in about May, it. May, um, I'm going to say May 10th, sometime in that area. Okay. Um, and did that go forward? No, I think John, uh, some of his treatment had to be rescheduled, and so they agreed to continue the oh, yes. hearing. Yes, and she's wearing pink on Wednesday. Um, and when was it rescheduled for? June, uh, and I don't recall the exact date, but maybe the. Tenth or so. Okay, it's true the defense um, didn't object. At any object. point prior to the motion to compel um, hearing that was scheduled, did anything change in terms of your understanding that would make you think the defense team was concerned about the motion to compel? No, I, I filed my formal notice of appearance so that I could be at the hearing. I think I actually did that in May before the first hearing. Um, and so I was prepared to be there to argue whatever needed to be argued. But um, as I go back and I look at my notes and my preparation, it was on the venue issue and the Mark and Tinsley. The, I'm going to turn this down just a little issue. bit. Mark Tinsley um, argued that this was the fuse that had been lit and that this June 10th hearing was going to be this huge shitstorm. And this is the defense saying that's not really what was happening. We're not really in a shit storm on the 10th. We're take, just in regular lightly. civil Mark litigation. That's the point of this witness. It's not really good. June 10th lawyer. wasn't some kind of crazy uh, uh, day in and, court. Uh, obviously a very emotional case. Uh, so I, I won't say that, that, um, that we weren't concerned about it, but uh, we knew that there had already been some other settlements, which we would have gotten So this credit counteracts for that. Tinsley's um, testimony. Uh, there were just a, a number of factors that made us feel like this was a defensible case and that it was not 
uh, an existential threat to, to um, Alex. Okay. And that's the point. This wasn't the thing that was going to end him. Oh, I love that. Are you go ahead and zoom in on Tinsley? Whether or not an order. Tinsley disagrees. Tinsley, the who they just focused on, is the attorney yes. for the Beach family. Uh, we call a Form 4 order was issued around October 7th or 8th of 2021. Who, of course, has to be in court today. Um, what is your understanding of that order? I've got it right here. Um, I mean, it said. Tinsley said that this order. John Tiller had not been able to. Oh, Tinsley get didn't get into this much. And that, in uh, the. Uh, it says right here. Uh, the Actual court testimony. at a hearing on plaintiff's motion to compel filed October 16, 2020, was informed that defendant's attorney Tiller, because of circumstances beyond his control, is unable to gather and provide the necessary information to answer the requested interrogatories at this time. Once this information is made available to attorney Tiller, the court will schedule a hearing on this motion to compel if necessary, which means that John Tiller was going to get the information, and then if he couldn't work it out with Mark, then well, that they would first have a row of to compel. seats they're so using the bar as a table. That's interesting. The court was ordering Alex to produce all of the financial information no. requested. No, that's not what it said. There's arguments about that, too. Yes, they're allowed to bring this in. This is a court order in the other case. Tinsley referred to it. Um, Tinsley, for those asking, Tinsley is not part of PMPED. Tinsley was suing Alec. His testimony and his 404 came, I think, in week three. I was just prepping the now significantly delayed quick bits on it because it's been so much info in my brain. But Tinsley was representing the beach, is representing the beach family, was going after Alec, right, is going after more. Alec um, financially. Did you expect any cataclysmic event um, That's a good on question. June 10th regarding Alex having to give over financial? Yeah, I saw Tinsley talking. handing notes. I don't yeah. like Tinsley's. Okay. And um, do you um, recognize Mr. Tinsley? Do you know him? Yep. Right there. You but it's him? just, of course, he, Tinsley's passing notes to the prosecution. Uh, okay. Um, I, uh, some of the behavior has been with aggressive time? with Tinsley. Yes. Um, but a number okay. of times, yeah. Tinsley's um, also standing up to a very no. difficult. Not that I remember. Uh, he says I did. I couldn't deny it, but I don't remember it. Tinsley's standing up okay. to a big right. machine, Thank so I don't. Thank you. I I understand Understood. why Tinsley came off as motions meant to really worry the, the defendants, right? Aggressive and defensive. Words, wasn't it? Could you repeat I, that? But he's a little you fast and loose in court sometimes. To get those financial and notes to the prosecution and stuff. I don't. The defendants. Those right. are your exact words, correct? Always, yeah. Okay. All right. And were you present? The motions the are meant to worry the defendant. Conference when Alec Murdoch came up and towered over Mark Tinsley and said, "What's up, Bo? What are you doing?" No, I, I don't get that. that. I don't get invited. Uh, okay. okay. I think you did. <laughs> but you weren't there when that happened, were you? No. You were present for when he did said that to that man right there about the boat case. What you doing, Bo? What's up? Objection. I, I, I was not there. Basis for the objection. Foundation. The objection is overruled. Creighton's very dramatic. And you did not. Second question. Okay, thank you, Jerome. All right. Um, and you did not get, you didn't file your notice of appearance into this case until May of 2021. Is that right? I think that's about right, yeah. What you, was funny was that you weren't the there with this. And that had to be resolved before you could get involved with Alec. Is that correct? That's part of the reason our, our firm was, yeah. Right. So you weren't couldn't have been with the conflict heavily involved in any discussions that were going on between Mark Tinsley and John Tiller and Amy Bauer prior to moving into May. Is that right? That wasn't ex exactly the reason. The, the conflict had been waived, but um, uh, I just wasn't involved in that. That was something uh, John and Mark were handling. Creighton's, right. Creighton's real excited about cross-examination. It is fun. Hearing on which the motion to compel it is fun. information was part of he didn't offer you as any sort of backup because you you weren't fully on the defense team at that point. Is that correct? I think I had planned to notice my appearance before that hearing. I just I can't recall whether I didn't do it because the case was continued. But I, I would have I would have appeared at the hearing. You were asked about insurance coverage, and you're talking about the Philadelphia policy, right? That there was a declaratory judgment. Right, right, right. And defense team knew that they weren't going to have any 
obligation to cover Alec in this, correct? I mean, it was very unlikely. In fact, it ultimately, Judge Sherry Lydon in the federal district court denied that Philadelphia had to cover Alec one penny, correct? Yeah, I'll have to say uh, I wasn't following that, but that's pretty much my understanding. It was a long shot that there would be coverage. And when you were at this point in time in May of June of 2021, just getting on the defense team, you certainly didn't know anything about his true financial condition, did you? No. You didn't know he'd been stealing money for years and years, did you? No. You didn't know that he was broke, did you? No. You didn't know he had misappropriated funds and was scrambling to try this to replace those before people found out, This is much did you? more powerful no. piecing for me. It's very concise questions. That is the cross pacing I personally prefer. It doesn't need to be dramatic because the answers are powerful, the questions are powerful, and it's like, you didn't know you're he's talking, stealing, you're asked you didn't know he's lying, you didn't know, you didn't know, you didn't know. It was continued because of these terrible murders. That correct? I prefer. Correct. That's your understanding. The that murders right. happened, and that hearing got continued because, of course, who's going to have a hearing in the wake of these terrible deaths, correct? Correct. I think Mark agreed to continue the of hearing. Because right. who wouldn't? Okay, got right? That's the point. Right. The hearing was continued. Even you don't murder your family to continue a, a hearing, though. That doesn't make attorney. sense. Even if you believe that a claim down the line may be defensible, that still doesn't change the discovery process in a, criminal, in a civil case that goes on, correct? That's true. I mean, discovery still can the happen question. and is going to happen, right. regardless of whether or not the case settles or goes to trial or whatever happens, correct? Yeah, it's still going on. And that's how civil cases, typically how cases work in court, is that both parties have to share a lot of information. Good questions. You know, one party doesn't want to share it, the other party can ask the judge to order it, correct? That's right. All right, and that goes on regardless of whether or not the claim is ultimately going to be successful. That's part of the initial process. Right. And that was on the table for June 10th. That was one of the things that was on the table, correct? The financial? Yes. Uh, yeah. And then there was a, the other interrogatories, too. And there was a number of other answer. things as well. Right. All right. And if that hearing had gone forward, there could have been an order issued compelling that process, correct? Could have been. Could have been. been. Yeah. All right. And so once that happens, once that order gets issued. Could have been. That's going to set in motion a train that's going to have to come to a conclusion in a court of law, correct? If that happened, right. Ultimately, the judge is going to decide what has to be produced and what doesn't. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sarah V., I agree with you. He wasn't expecting to be confronted at work. And I think the work confrontation combined with the pressure of this is the combination. Thank you, Mr. Um, Cook. Thanks. And I think that's the combination. But Creighton is clearly loving cross-examination. But this witness explained, and he said, look, these motions are filed to put pressure on. The point of these motions is to put pressure on. Alec was under pressure with the financial crimes. When you add this, this isn't enough, but when you add this to the law firm, add and add and add, and the text messages from the family, then you start to get that complete picture. And that's where the prosecution is going. The defense is going, this is ridiculous. This is just normal. It's defensible. This isn't the this you. isn't the end uh, Mr. Waters of things. Just asked you for your opinion as to the June tenth hearing, and based on your forty years of experience, he opened the door. I did cases. not ask for her for the opinion. I just asked what potentially could happen. Should let her finish the question. Let me hear the question. <laughs> based on your forty years of experience. What was your opinion of the likelihood that the order to compel would be granted? Objection, Your Honor. I think he could ask, she could ask what the outcomes were. This. Just because it's possible that the order could have been granted, does that make it plausible? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Okay. This is where the road of speculation ends in this case? This, this, this is where it is? Okay. You can ask him what the three outcomes are. What are the outcomes that happens? And if it's granted, then what happens? And go that route. If it gets granted, then what do you do? Is it a big deal? 
I think I would take that tack. If the judge had ordered the documents to be produced oh, at hey. the hearing, would Alec have had to turn them over immediately? Like that? No. Exactly. That's their point. That's all I have. Thank you. That's the point. Okay, further. She could have gone a little further on that. If that had happened, it would have set in a process, set in motion a process, though, would it not have? So let me rephrase if, that question. If he'd ordered, if he'd ordered production of all of the documents that were requested, right? Yeah, uh, that, would have, that would have been part of the process, right? It, it would have started a process, an order of a judge, correct? That's true. A yeah. slow it process. Would eventually, if the judge had ordered that, correct? If he ordered production of all the documents, right? Nothing further. Thank you. Next up, down. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. <laughs> next <Chat>. witness. <laughs> Please, of course, John, the next witness is um, an expert. It's going to take a while. We can begin. Who wants lunch? lunch? And then <laughs> and just, and do whatever you want to do. We'll go for about a half an hour. Then Who break. wants lunch, if Your we Honor? Anticipate him, however. Let's all stand and stretch for a moment. Poot wants lunch. Look, as, as much as Poot's style annoys me sometimes, I appreciate that Poot is always looking to break early. Poot's ready for lunch. Poot's ready to be done at the end of the day. Poot is ready to boot scoot to a nappy nap and a snacky snack, and I am here for it. Because on day 22 of this trial, I'm ready to boot scoot out for a nappy nap and a snacky snack. But Poot is like, this is gonna take forever. Do we have to start now? And the court's like, we have 30 minutes. We're starting the fuck now. Um, Spaceman said, Emily, it's like you know what you're doing. I've just been a lawyer for 17 years. I know what questions I would ask. Sometimes the lawyers do, sometimes they don't. But I know what I would want to ask, and so that's what it is. I'm going to ask, uh, answer some more questions while we're here. For those of you that um, signed up for the email group yesterday, we've got an email coming out to you, too, with a discount code for the shop. Don't worry. Um, Y'all overwhelmed the system, so we weren't able to send an email this morning as we intended, but that is coming to you. Make sure you look for an email from at the Emily, no, at emilygbaker.com and make sure it didn't go to spam or to promotional and then you will get it. So we've got another half an hour till lunch. I'm going to answer some questions. And then when I come back this afternoon, I'll give you all the links for the bar association and stuff. I've shared those on Patreon as well. So thank you, Law Nerds, for helping us test our system and make sure it can handle volume because, you know, I wish we could object absurdity. Um, it happened in Depp v. Heard. It was like objection what? That did happen in Depp v. Heard. It's pink day today. Anti-bullying day. I didn't know today was anti-bullying day. I'm here for it. But both of the attorneys on the defense side, both the female attorneys on the defense side, or two of the female attorneys on the defense side are wearing pink. I don't have, I should have worn pink under the cardi. And I wore, I went with I have questions instead. Um, Do I went with I have questions. The testimony you give today will be the truth. And coffee and cursing. The truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do have a seat? Um, Tinsley has passed four pages of notes to Waters. How is that okay? He's an attorney He's and witness involved in the case. It's odd, though, to me. It just, it's odd to me. But he's not passing them to somebody that's in custody, and that's a difference. And if you would please state your name and spell your last name for us, please. Yes, sir. Kenneth. Last name is Zerci, Z like zebra, E R C I E. Zerci? Like Cersei? But Zerci? Kenneth Zerci, what are you here testifying about? Good morning, Your Honor. Wait, who's asking you questions? Poot, where are your notes? Oh my God. Poot. Did somebody just say in the chat it's snowing in Arizona? <coughs> All right. Enjoy, Cindy. Mr. Jersey. Enjoy yes, sir. Snow in Arizona. Please tell the jury a little bit about yourself. Uh, I like April twenty third <laughs> in Madison, Connecticut. You only need a light and, sweater. And um, what do you do in Madison, Connecticut? Currently, live with my wife, and my son lives up the street from us. That's delightful. Uh, what are you here for, though? I'm employed by the Henry Seeley Institute of Forensic Science at the University of New Haven. Um, as the director of training. In addition to that, I'm also on staff at the university. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Maybe it's just me, but. <sighs> I'm also the... on staff at the university as an adjunct professor in various forensic science disciplines. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, you've been in law, involved in law enforcement in your life? 
Yes, sir, I have. Tell the jury, please, where you began. In 1974, I became an officer with the New Haven Police Department, also in Connecticut. I was promoted to the rank of detective most of my career there, uh, for my 11-year duration prior to retiring was with the identification unit responsible for crime scene processing, evidence collection, photography, and preliminary examination of physical evidence that's found at a crime scene. Um, after that, I retired based on a disability. I was injured and was almost immediately hired by the state of Connecticut at the Forensic Science Lab. Like we got located you. Located in Meriden. I'm sorry, and tell me what that was again. What was that position? The second career, if you will, was at the Department of Public Safety. Who definitely wants lunch. Division of Scientific Services Forensic Science Laboratory. I'm better this Originally morning. brought in as a latent fingerprint Eating analyst, also doing footwear tire tracking examination, as well as becoming the senior person as far as crime scene related activity that the laboratory would respond to to assist investigative agencies. Over a 29 year career, I was promoted through the ranks and eventually retired as director of the laboratory. And that's director of the Division of Scientific Services for the state of Connecticut. Yes, sir. And in your duties there, um, no, you not a indicated you um, started off not as a supervisor or as a supervisor? Not as a supervisor, as a criminalist, right, with a specific function. And a criminalist doing Ask what? Ask him kind what's of, so specific uh, about the function. Work? Please. Starting primarily with fingerprints, latent fingerprint identification, and all the processing techniques involved. Because I had also experience doing footwear and tire track from the police department, I was given that task. Footwear. And again, because of the crime scene background, ding, 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 ding. also ended up as one of the senior people going to the major crime scenes when the laboratory services. Sir, what do you know about the red bottoms? And eventually ended up supervising the photography section because of that type of background as well. So photography is important in processing yep. the crime scene? Absolutely. And um, it's often overlooked. Uh, fingerprints or footprints or tire tracks or everything? It involves the entire is scene. So it's the important. only way to bring the crime scene before a jury on it well. after the I think it's the occurred. footwear guy. Right, so it can be reviewed or We're seen. We're going to talk about this a little bit later once uh, I've uh, had you qualified in these different areas. But um, after, um, and how long were you? Um, at the Division of Scientific Services? For 29 years. Right, now also, um, and you ultimately became the supervisor of that department for the state of Connecticut. The director of the laboratory. Okay, so you were there from July of 84 to October of 2012. Yes, sir. And what did you do after 2012? I've been an adjunct professor at four different universities, um, off and on during that period as well as approximately 20 to 25 years prior to retiring. Um, I maintain that. I've also had a private consulting business that I've kind of let go by the wayside a little bit. Um, so what's the Henry C. Lee Institute of Forensic Science? It's located at the University of New Haven. It's a separate entity under the university, and we're involved in doing scholarships, training and education, um, providing consulting, work in cases, whether it's for the defense or the prosecution, um, but more to stay involved with the community and provide modern technologies. Okay, and then you're the owner and principal analyst for Forensic Consultants of New England LLC. What is that? Again, that was the private business that I had on the side for doing consulting work. Are you still doing that? Technically, this case falls under that today. <laughs> now, yes, um, you're what's watching your educational it. Background? We're doing it now. As far as criminal justice and forensic science, I have an associate's degree in criminal justice administration, a bachelor of science in what was called police science, basically a hybrid between administration and the forensic applications or sciences, and a master's a master's of a master's of science in forensic science. That's all from uh, the University of New Haven. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, you have a resume with um, several pages of um, different teaching things you've done. I'm not going to go into those in detail. Sir, you've done a lot of um, shit. Now, um, you have taught a number of courses, is that right? Yes, sir. Um, everything from footprints to blood stains to tire tracks to um, uh, 
crime scene supervision to um, did you ever let a bunch of lawyers stay in a house instead of serving um, a search warrant i have some questions can we ask him that is that within his area um, of expertise have you ever been i want to know qualified to by any court to testify about fingerprint identification the, the that is in a federal or state court in this country yes sir i have and um how many times approximately 300 300 times and can you remember all the courts or several of the courts I can remember the states that they were in, but the specific ones, probably not. Connecticut, I suppose. Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts, Florida. Um, Listen up. Okay, and how many times have <laughs> you been qualified on um, footprints, or like, uh, the more technical would be, what would you call that? Full or tire track examination or imprint analysis. Imprint analysis. How probably many about 200. 300 times you've been qualified by state or I thought he said 200. To be an expert on that topic. About 200 as far as footwear and tire track. Okay. Um, now what about... That's a uh, lot of times. And maybe I'm getting this term wrong. Uh, crime scene management or crime scene analysis. You've taught courses on that, correct? So he's going to be... And been an active participant at crime scenes, yes. He's going to be an expert in multiple areas. Um, how many times you've been qualified, if you have, by federal or state court to testify on that topic? Qualified, probably 400. 400 times. It's a lot. Yes, sir. And you've testified. Yes, sir. And this is both state and federal courts? Yes, sir. Um, Your Honor, I would move to qualify him as an expert in fingerprint analysis, footprint analysis, tire print analysis, and uh, um, crime scene uh, analysis management what sir tell me what the term is let me make sure no, i'm not screwing the prosecution this should pay crime attention scene. to these areas scene examination as an overarching title there you go crime scene the prosecution should pay attention this burned them yesterday <laughs> uh, he, he said it i didn't hear it. how many times have you been qualified in tire impressions 200 200 no. tire and footwear no question. he's so qualified thank you thank you but he's qualified in multiple areas about, again. I have a PowerPoint here somewhere. I believe I sent you all last night. Yeah. Oh, Can we call God. Out, please? Can you prepare the PowerPoint for your testimony here today? Sir, do you have a PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Okay. Can we put that up on the screen, please? Is there pause attraction? And if there's not pause attraction. I can, sir. <clears throat> Good questions. These are the so, worst chairs ever. So I want to apologize to this, is this witness. The PowerPoint, sir. You're clearly it's the first slide. Yes, okay. well and qualified. What is this showing us, basically, it was put together just to give a quick demonstration on what can be done with physical evidence at a crime scene, and some of the base requirements that are involved. Okay. Um, this says recording of imprint, impression evidence, seizure of item, photography, lifting methods, and enhancement. And that's sort just of just want to see if it's pulled up on screen. What we're about to see, correct? The Lawnard Zoo love yes, a PowerPoint. Yes, it's also an outline of what could be done with physical evidence at a crime scene, and then later on at the laboratory. Okay. Next oh, one, yeah. please. This man is going to talk about how SLED conducted their crime now, scene, um, and I'm interested this to is hear photographic it. Photographic evidence, enhanced photographs of the question imprint. There is fair use, criticism to be had there. Enter comparison examination with known footwear outsoles or transparencies of known footwear outsoles. Well, explain that. What does that mean? With all types of evidence, especially at a crime scene, as I mentioned before, photography is one of the keys, documenting the evidence in place. Uh, in many cases, you can't take the evidence back to a laboratory, so you have to rely on the photographic images. If they're taken with quality equipment, quality cameras, and in a proper format, um, a lot of work can be done with them. They can be associated to a known and a question. Um, photography is still the key for bringing the scene either into the laboratory or into the courtroom. And are there certain, and we're going to see this in just a minute, certain... Well, if you're going to see it in a minute, wait till then. Requirements, I guess is the right word to use, on how those photographs are taken, depending on what you want to use them for. Correct. There are different types of photography, just as we have portrait photography here, um, the media that's present. Um, all of that is a form of documentation. Okay. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And, and by the way, intercomparison examination with known footwear outsoles or transparencies of known footwear outsoles. What does that mean? There's a difference between taking a picture of something and then taking a photograph for examination quality. 
where you do need the detail to find the individual characteristics that might be present for a comparison. And again, it would be a known, whatever the known object is, whether it's a shoe, a fingerprint, uh, could be a tool mark, it could be any type of pattern, and the sample that's found at the scene, okay, or against the instrument that may have caused that mark. The more detailed the image is, the better the quality of the examination, and the more reliable the showing of the detail and proportion. So the side-by-side -side comparison is your known and your question. Okay, because most of these are basically eyeball examinations, either under a microscope or looking at it just Eyeballs. with your naked eye, correct? All of the above. Right. Okay. Next, please. Photographic techniques, FUSS. Tell us what that means. It's just an acronym to help the photographer uh, remember to do certain things, especially when it comes to analytical photographs. You want to take whatever the image on a picture or inside the viewfinder of the camera, such as a gentleman has, and fill that entire <laughs> image that captures the picture. You're maximizing the amount of detail that can be retained either in a this digital format This is not well done a in a lot of departments, by um, the way. The opposite would be taking a medium close-up, where you show an overview, multiple items, uh, or something as a wide-angle shot of the entire courtroom. So there's a whole series of photographs that go with this method. Secondly, using a scale. If it's going to be used for analysis, you want a known reference in there so that you can recreate the image later in a dark room or on a computer so that the image is now in life-size proportion. Who dark rooms? I've got so questions. Again, if I have an article of footwear, I can place that or take a sample from it. That would be one-to-one -one or life-size. I can recreate the image either taken from the crime scene or the stand or the photograph, so no, it's at scale. using that scale to that same reference. I can also recreate that one-to-one -one so that I can get a size proportion right as part of the analysis. Um, it would also be an elimination. If the sizes were different, it couldn't be from the same source. And that's fair, the sizes matter. is a lighting matter. technique that's used. Right? When a photograph is taken, if it's an object of interest and if you're using it for analysis, you may want a side light coming in at different angles to show the different detail Dimension. that might that be there, sense. especially in a three-dimensional picture. Two-dimensional, Oh, I love that some of you guys still use dark critical. rooms. Day, that's very cool. Right. And lastly, I think several shots. You want to take multiple exposures of your I love image. a dark room. I, it's um, not digital happening digital photography in crime scene today, photography, it's a lot easier because the image pops up. I can see it in artistic So you can see that you've captured it. I don't even, in past I don't know technologies, what crime, I mean, maybe some you a photograph on film have, and you couldn't see the result they might until you process the film, which is usually long after you've left the scene or the incident. Um, so there's several advantages to the newer technologies. So this says special note, film plane must be level parallel to the imprint impression. Yes, sir. What does that mean? The film plane is actually the back of the camera. It's where the image is actually captured. We're going that a long way plane, to get to SLED didn't take the right pictures here, in the right way. I think the whole chat here. already agrees with those you, sir. Images parallel. Sir, we're here. We're it with you. Distortion and vignetting. The jury's probably okay, the also the with you. The angles may come up. If you think of a tall building, right, and you look up at it, the building tends to come together. The same thing happens with angular photography. Okay, there's distortion okay. that occurs. And even in close-up images. Right. By using the scales. Yeah, look at my driver's sure license image. It is so distorted. Is to the I don't object look that like you're that. taking. All right. You awful. try to avoid that distortion as one of the considerations. And again, it would give you a more accurate rendering. So when you take this photograph, you can compare it to a footprint, a fingerprint, a tire track. Mm -hmm. You want it, the, the photograph to be, the camera's lens to be parallel to that, so you're looking straight down at it. Yes, sir. That's one of the shots you should get, but that's the, the most important shot. For analytical quality imaging, yes. Right. If you, I mean, you're not taking it for to send home to mom. It's for analytical purposes, correct? Yes, sir. And then you have other shots from the side or whatever, and and that helps you if you see a detail, get more perspective on it, if you will. It could, but it also shows the orientation to the surrounding area. And again, that three-shot sequence: close up, medium close up, and then an overview. You're telling a story through pictures. So let me chop and sort of go off. You're capturing for a all of the you context. You started with the what police department? When you went? go out to City in or into Haven. out. And what was your role or job when you started? Initially, as a patrolman, uh, doing patrol activities. Okay. 
Spent a year in the Corporation Council doing civil investigation. Unfortunately, I got hurt. And after did, that, how did, you get, how did you get hurt? A poop. A burglar on the premise call. I fell through a drywall and ended up destroying my left knee. Okay. Um, and so you had to leave the police department. I've also no. destroyed well, my left knee. It was. He's like, not that time. About nine years later. Okay. So did you continue to be a patrolman after hurting? No. Me? I was promoted and went into the identification unit after leaving the Corporation Council and was performing crime scene related activities, basic investigation. So again, so when you first started, I mean, you were a detective at that point? When I first started as a patrol officer. You, no, you're not a detective when you detective. first start. Okay. And when you're doing crime, responding to murder scenes or house breakings or whatever. Yes, sir. You were a detective at that point? As Plain some police officer or detective, yes. So when you responded to the scene, did you take a camera? Yes, sir, always. Okay. And did you follow fuss? Yes, sir. And so yeah, and they're I mean, supposed to take them wrong. And policy at they're supposed to take correct? them raw yes and also the teaching and the specialized schools that i had been to okay and you started that in the 80s in the 70s 70s i'm sorry um so this is what you've done while you were a police officer for a span of decades correct yes sir starting, in the, it. starting in the 70s yes sir so this isn't some new found procedure this is something you've done for four decades correct okay Next, look please. at this photograph. So this is use of a tripod when photo photographing evidence with detail. A tripod must be used. It's recommended. It makes it more stable. You don't have to worry about even the pulse in your fingers. And depending on the length of the exposure that's necessary, um, causing any vibration or I think Poot is boring himself as part of the problem. And this is a process or procedure. Um, and this shows a guy shooting out in front not straight down. That would be incorrect? For a documentation or an analytical photograph, yes. Okay. What happens is his camera's at an angle. He's doing a flat object here. And again, the That's distortion hard. effects that I explained earlier. Okay. And this is also a procedure you followed for decades? Yes, sir. And is it a procedure you taught when you taught police officers? Yes, sir. And is it a procedure you heard about when you attended classes? Yes, sir. Okay, next, please. And what does this depict? Here we have two examples of the position Sorry for yawning, of the Chad. camera. Right, it's hard. Line drawings on I'm a just. tripod showing the proper orientation to an object being photographed. You've right, got to lay the, the foundation. Plane, even if the item is on an just. angle, the camera and the lens will also be on that same angle. And they haven't right, put the... Again, to avoid distortion. So you ought to have a tripod and it ought to be, the lens ought to be parallel they haven't put up the PowerPoint. Whatever shooting at. It makes it easier to have the tripod, yes. Right. Next. Well, yeah, you, if you're taking footprint photos, you want them to um, be demonstration flat. Is the same thing? So that it's a you don't have any distortion. It's a showing what happens when you don't do that. I don't if know why they the haven't put up the exhibit. The the black dots, Aren't they publishing it distorted. to the jury? All right. They're not in proper proportion, and there's some angularity. Why isn't it being published? Yeah, Everything else has been published. Okay, now... Sorry, y'all. Tell us what these photographs are of. What, where did, where did these I'm going to start from? pulling up some of the cheap These are images that stream. I took at a homicide scene in the state of Oh, that's of New why. York. That's fair. Right. Essentially, we were asked to come and assist um, mutual aid, similar to the different agencies here. I saw some of Alex's family there. By going the to New York. brothers earlier. We had certain things that maybe their laboratory or their crime scene unit didn't have access to. Um, so what, tell me what the difference is. Well, the two photographs show a kitchen area. On the right-hand side, Yeah, crime scene like processing kitchen, shouldn't be right, subjective. And if you look directly down on the floor, Giselle, I agree. there's kind of a reddish stain that you can barely see. By using various chemical processing methods, as well as photo documentation, right, I'll get the picture on the left, I was able to bring up a lot more footprints a little bit. that were occult or latent. They were kind of invisible, just in very light <coughs> blood residue. And the screening tests that we used to try to develop those. This would be much right, more interesting. The proteins that are in blood and causes a color change so that the now they're more With visible. With the PowerPoint. Um, even if you couldn't see that area in the beginning. All right, similar to a latent print that's invisible when you touch what, the surface. And what's a latent print? It could be a footprint, it could be a fingerprint, 
but it's whatever residue is there that's left on a surface that you can't normally see without some type of enhancement. Okay, and so you put a... You that's going to come up in the Idaho the case quite a lot. I put the chemical on the floor. And what was it? It was orthoatylidine. Say that again? Orthoatylidine. Okay, and what year was this? Uh, Approximately. Well, I answered that at the Mid 80s. In the 80s. So this is not some newfound chemical. It's been no, around sir. for 40 years. It's not years. one of them newfangle, newfangled things, this is right? This y'all were doing in the 80s. Yes, sir. Okay. And if it's good so enough for the 80s, it it's the good enough for us today. Floor. It's sprayed with an aerosol, uh, very similar to misting from a deodorant can or hairspray. Okay. And how long does it take sir? to raise these? previously invisible footprint. hairspray or, or like a setting mist. spray like a fine mist so setting spray we once that. those are raised what's the next step if we go to the next slide next slide basically yeah. setting up the tripod the camera right to do photo documentation the other option is literally to cut the sections out of the floor or counter or whatever the imprint or impressions <laughs> on and take that with you did you just take photographs did you cut up the floor we relied on photographs in this case okay and this He's is like, I wasn't at the crime see, scene. So you're shooting straight down on the image. Yes, sir. Okay, next. And what is that? That's an example of what the footprint actually looked like after enhancement. Any of the bluish, greenish areas were not visible right in the beginning. Lindsay K. made a great point blue, for a super here. chat. See Seems like Alec Murnau wanted his lawyer buds to know this, so the financial crimes would immediately pale as to calling all the lawyers over Correct. to the murder scene. Okay. It's like, look at what I've been through. The it's a very fair point. Next. Look at what I've been through. How could this? you hold me accountable Again, for the other stuff that's inevitably coming out? Again, it's an example of a footprint or two. Um, oh, in this case, it's thought. actually on plywood, and it appears to be in a blood-like substance. Okay. The Next. scale is there just for size and measurement. The scale is important. Right. Next. What is that? This is after enhancement, okay, after go, applying the same go, chemical. Go back. Forward. We can't all see because so, nobody shared with the class. That same, what was the name of that chemical? Orthoatylidine. We've heard some testimony about something called LCV. Is that the same thing or similar? It's similar. It's a protein dye stain, and there's several others. And would it raise if you sprayed it like this and took? I mean, would it raise the? I'm going to answer this at the break because I want to answer that more. Thing? Quite possibly. Each one of the reagents has a sensitivity level. Some are more sensitive than others. And you don't use LCV? We've used LCV. We've used amino black. We've used phenolphthalein. Okay. So there's any number of they options. They used amino no black in has Idaho. The color. You want to have something different than the background color so that you get to have contrast. And that's the other part about photography. You need contrast to see something. So like LCV, I think, turns things so purplish. Purple. So if you have dark background, you would not want to use LCV. Most probably, yes. Because purple. Okay. Next. Kirsten said the all dress ruffles are amazing. They are. Is that it? Okay. What time is it? Your Honor, it's four minutes till one. This might be a good time to break. <laughs> all right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will break for lunch until two fifteen. Please do not discuss the case. I will be back here at 110. I'm not leaving yet, don't worry, but I will be back here at 110. Um, and then this afternoon I will be taking a brief break for a bar association. We're gonna keep the stream running so you guys can watch the court feed and I will put the link where I'll be talking about celebrity cases for a CLE that you know I agreed to months and months and months ago, actually sometime last year, well before I knew we were going to be into week Five. We're in recess till 2.15. Of this trial. Yes, sir. Before you leave. Very quickly, I was going to hand out those three cases I mentioned this morning. Yep. What, why are we talking about this pen? Is that the pen that's been in Jim's mouth the whole time? All right, did you bring it up for the class, Creighton? All right, the judge is like, do what you do. I'm out. <laughs> and the judge has walked off the bench. All right, we're going to get to some questions and answers again if you signed up for law nerd alerts yesterday you're going to be getting an email go ahead and look for it it will be coming from no reply at emilydbaker.com and your discount code will be in there for the law nerd shop um let us continue going with some questions i'm going to swoop a dupe real quick 
We're going to talk about this, uh, what happened this morning. It looks like we're just about to bing at 696. That road to 700K is, uh, we're getting there, y'all. We're getting there. So anyway, let's continue. Let's swoop a doop. And then let's take, let's, let's take some lunch. The, this morning started out so fiery. Swoop a doop. This morning started out fiery. For those of you just joining later in the morning, I get it. This trial starts early on the East Coast. Very early for those of you not on the East Coast. It started with the defense wanting the judge to rule on the question of whether the defense, no, the prosecution's cross-examination of Alec Murdoch will be limited if he waived his Fifth Amendment right to testify. When you waive your rights, there's a whole thing that happens outside the jury. We're going to probably see that this afternoon. There's a whole thing that happens outside the presence of the jury about waiving a defendant waiving his right to testify. But I've never seen that limited in scope to just the crimes that they're charged with. They can generally be asked about other bad acts, other events, other things. And the defense is arguing, yes, but generally they can only talk about convictions this case is different because of all the 404 and the judge is going to limit it. He's going to be allowed to ask about the theft. The chat was all like, what does this even matter? He confesses to stealing the money in like four different conversations. Well, it matters to the defense because they need to be able to advise their client on exactly what he's in for. If he testifies in this case, they know that he's going to be convicted on the financial crimes. I don't think there's a question that he'll be convicted on the financial crimes. I think he has confessed on the financial crimes. Now it's a question of does him testifying and knowing that he's going to put a kind of a nail in the financial crimes cases, is it worth it to clear your name of the homicides if there's something that needs to be said? Does this jury expect to hear from him? They've already heard all his dirty laundry. I don't know how much worse it can get. They've heard all the dirty laundry. Does it get worse for him if he testifies? Well, it, depend, it depends on what he says. Would, would a jury believe him? If he said, yeah, I was stealing. Yeah, I was lying. Yeah, I was doing all of this to the people around me. But I thought I could climb my way out of it and killing my family doesn't make any sense. Would that be persuasive to the jury or is it too great of a risk? Or does Alec give a fuck what his lawyers think? And he's like, whatever, I'll do it anyway. And we saw that in the third interview with um, Corey Fleming where Corey Fleming's like, I don't think we should answer this question. And Alec's like, yeah, 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 whatever. I, I'm going to talk my way out of it. Or has Alec now seen the words can and will be used against you in a court of law? Is he now seeing the and will part of this? And he's seen the, third, the three interviews and he's like, this is too risky. Or is he confident in his ability to talk his way out of this trial? He's been watching this jury closely. The... the Witnesses that know him, especially the lawyers, have said his skill was people, reading people, talking to people, telling people what they wanted to hear. But those weren't people sitting in judgment of him on a jury looking for him to lie or tell the truth. It's a lot harder to bullshit people when you're the defendant on trial. So we'll see. Will his, will his um, hubris get the best of him in this case? Or will his lawyers advise him not to testify? In it's very limited circumstances that the defendant testifying actually helps. And they know this. But he might think he's smarter than everyone in the room. And we'll see if that's the case. And if it is, that's going to happen tomorrow. So I think we're going to do shoe print, shoe print, impression print, dude, for most of the rest of today. It seems like we're going to do that. So... We'll put up a poll this afternoon again if we think we'll see Alec testify. I asked this morning um, if we thought we would. This morning, do you think Alec Murdoch will testify? 70% said no. 29% said yes with almost 20,000 votes. I'll put up another poll on the community tab so we can vote between now and tomorrow. I'll put one up on Twitter and we'll see. I also asked about the lawyer witness we heard from this morning. Does this wit Who does this witness help, the prosecution or defense? 84% of you said that witness helped the prosecution. 15% said the defense. 
And that was with just over 16,000 votes. I thought it was a good witness. I summarized that witness pretty thoroughly at the break, so I'm not going to summarize that witness much more. That'll all be timestamped for the replay crew that we so adore over here on this channel. Let's get to some questions, and then let's get some lunch, yeah? Let's get some lunch. Everyone's tired. I'm tired. You're tired. Can you imagine? Can you imagine, chat, how fatigued this jury must be? Because we're fatigued and we're in our homes all day long. Well, some of y'all are at work and all the things. We're fatigued. They're sitting in the horrendous chairs in the 68-degree cold courtroom with people staring at them all day. Can you imagine how fatigued they are under the, the lights? <sighs> fatigued. I'm fatigued. You're fatigued. Can you imagine these jurors? They must be so fatigued. All right. With that, let's get to, let's fack around for a few minutes and then I'm going to get some lunch. I've also got some some worky work ado that I have to do to make sure we don't keep 404ing because the law nerds keep going to lawnerdalert.com to sign up <laughs> and it keeps crashing. So we're going to figure that out. Emilydbaker.com slash lawnerdalert has been really stable. So I'm going to figure out why our um, our other link is not working great. So that, that, that. Let's go. I meant to hit the thing. Oh, so tired. Y'all, we're all, we're all just cheer we're all cheers just like bring the coffee bring the snacks bring the nap i gotta tell you though i really enjoy chat chat you guys have some great points this morning it's great seeing everybody's perspective i know for some this is this is the part of the trial emily you're still talking you said you were getting questions i know this is the part of the trial that gets really hard. It gets really hard, A, to still be paying attention, and B, depending on how you think about the case, it gets really hard in the middle of the defense case to keep an open mind. So I would just encourage all of you to see which way you're feeling, see which way you're leaning, and see if you are looking at, am I looking for things to confirm what I already suspect? Am I looking for things to challenge what I suspect? Or am I just taking things in in this court as they happen and then categorizing them? It's a really interesting way to start to break down your own thinking process, your own critical thinking. It's like, what about the things that are challenging what I believe about this case? How do I feel about those things? And again, it is it is a good exercise on how hard it is to be on jury duty when you're tasked with not making up your mind until the end. It is hard to not make up your mind until the end. And I encourage all of you to try. You're not on this jury. And I am not going to judge you I at all. But challenge yourself the way this jury is having to mentally challenge themselves, sitting in this court, trying to keep an open mind. I find that this case is interesting because there's so many fucking questions still. But what are those things that are going to, what are those things that are going to matter to this jury the most? All right. Let us continue with questions. I know I won't get to everything. Um, I'm going to do my best. Natasha G said, is limiting even a thing? Is limiting the testimony even a thing? There are some, this judge is not going to pre-restrict testimony. They can, the judge can do that in some ways. That's what motions in limine are for, to like limit certain areas of conversation before the trial happens. This judge is saying, no, I want to hear the questions. This judge did limit the testimony with regard to the roadside incident until the defense started probing into it more. And then the judge was like, well, you opened the door for it. So now we're in. Now we're here. We live here now. But yes, motions in limine are to pre-limit things. It's different when it's a criminal trial a bit. And it's different when it's a criminal defendant saying, I'm waiving my Fifth Amendment right. And then I'm going to go testify and try to assert it as to certain things. It's a kind of unique situation in this case. Because normally when defendants have cases pending, they, if they're in trial, they're often in trial on all of the things they have pending. And if they're not in trial on all of the things they have pending, they don't testify. This is a strange, this is a strange case in so many ways. Jen said, can the defense use this in front of the jury to explain why he doesn't testify? No, he wants to tell you what happened, but they will use it in the financial crimes. So he can't, but it's not his fault. They can't comment on his right to testify or not to testify. There's a jury instruction that says that the jury can't speculate if he chooses not to testify, but no, they can't be like, well, he would tell you what happened, but the prosecution won't let him. That won't fly. Um, it doesn't mean this defense team won't try to allude to it. 
Why does he want to take the stand? I think he thinks he can help. Or, or the defense attorneys are just doing their job to make sure that they are asking for everything they can ask for and that they are protecting their client the best way that they can. And they can't really advise their client the best way that they can until they know what this judge will do. I think they can guess what this judge is going to do, but they don't know what this judge is going to do until, um, until they ask. So I think they're really, that is them doing their job. I have seen the chat absolutely blow up and I can't go back and grab it, but hello, Bailey. It's good to see you. I was actually watching Bailey Sarian last night. I was watching dark history as I was prepping our, um, our quick bets. Thank you. The Bailey, there's no catching up. It's just the shark has been jumped. We have jumped the shark. We, I, there's no catching up, but we're in the defense case. So if the defendant testifies tomorrow, everything else isn't going to matter. We're just going to look at the defendant testifying tomorrow. It's good to see you. Um, we're getting we're getting through questions, and then we'll be back after lunch for the footwear and tread expert, who's also going to say that Sled did a shit job at the crime scene. There's that testimony summarized. Um, Gail said Walmart of him to have all these people come. Before law enforcement polluted the crime scene, no one should have been there until after law enforcement processed the scene. And law enforcement didn't block them from coming in. They didn't. I think they're afraid of them, but now it's biting them in the ass. And you saw people saying, shouldn't you block off this entrance so people aren't coming in? And the sheriff was like, yeah, we'll get to it. And then they were... This, this crime scene was not perfectly preserved. I think the Colton County sheriffs that showed up did the best that they could. I really do think they tried um, but I also think that they were afraid to tell Alec and his friends to get the fuck out of the crime scene. I really do. And they were treating it like, not like a murder investigation. I think at the beginning for Alec, they weren't treating him as a suspect. They were treating him as an aggrieved um, reporting party. That said, I have seen aggrieved family members. I mean, mostly through reports and body cam footage, but I have seen aggrieved family members try to break through the crime scene to get to their family member and be tackled by law enforcement, which is just a horrible situation for everyone involved. But I've seen, I have seen that happen. That did not happen in this case at all. That did not happen in this case at all. Amora asked Emily, did you watch the Netflix documentary yet? When did, didn't it come out like this morning? No, I haven't even watched new housewives, real housewives of New Jersey yet. It has been this case, all this case, and then doing all the other things to keep up with this case. No, I've been working, mostly working and then working. The only things I've watched really are YouTube videos in the background while I'm also working. And I can't watch the Netflix documentary yet because it, then the information that I need to get into QuickBits will get confused in my brain. So until the QuickBits are done, I won't watch it. I might watch it this weekend when I can make sure that I've cordoned off what I know from other, other things and then what I know from watching this case from the evidence in court. It's hard because in this one, I started covering it well before I thought or knew that Ellick would be charged with murder. I started covering this with the roadside incident and the attorney theft because um, South Carolina, Girardi, and then he gets shot in the head and then he admits that the shooting in the head is staged. What? So I started covering it there. By the time he got charged with murder, I had already known so much about the case. I was like, uh, what? So that Question, do they have someone working on Alec Murdoch's appeal while the case is going on in the event Alec is convicted? I mean, I don't know what this defense team does, but they probably have their, they've got their objections noted and they are noting things for appeal. But no, there's nothing to appeal really until they know and it would just be a waste of money. But they are, the attorneys, the defense attorneys are mindful towards appeal and making sure they preserve the issues well for the record. So that's kind of a kind of answer. Miss Genoa, I think it was the plan to get so many of his friends there that night. Having that many lawyers present would not only contaminate the crime scene, but intimidate police. And I think that's what we saw happen. I think that's what we saw happen. At some point, though, is this law firm's a big family. So they're all going to show up to support and try to help and try to fix it. Lawyers want to fix things. And they're going to push their weight around to try to fix things. Um, and I think in this case, the lawyers showing up thought that they were going to help find whoever did this or determine if they were in danger. They were, the lawyers that showed up were worried about Buster. They were worried about Alec. They were worried about other members at the firm, but Alec wasn't by all reports from multiple witnesses. And that might stick with the jury too. Everyone else is worried about Buster, but Alec, everyone else is worried about their safety, but Alec, why is he not worried? 
So many things bother me. I think the who would do this would be more normal thing to say rather than look what they did. It, 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 I think it can be argued both ways, truthfully, because they're going to argue that they did them so bad. And the prosecution is sticking with they're arguing I did them so bad. But even if it's they did them so bad, it's like, oh, we immediately knew it was they. Why do we immediately think it's multiple people? Why is it, you know, and that's a fair point. They're not saying who, what, find who did this. Do you know? But then again, people in shock situations do things, wild things, things that they don't know, things that they don't remember, say things they don't remember. And so you don't know how you're going to act in that situation. And the jury is going to be running through those thoughts too. It's like, yeah, well, he just saw the most horrific thing. It's, can the lawyers be charged with obstruction of justice for interfering the June 7th crime scene? What a mess. Anna Kay, no. They didn't do anything they weren't allowed to do. Law enforcement let them on scene. Law enforcement let them into the house. Law enforcement told them the scene was clear when they started to clean up. Law enforcement didn't tell them to preserve their house. They said, go down to the house. They didn't do anything wrong. Law enforcement didn't stop them from doing anything. Um, he wrung all those people, but not Maggie's family. It's a very salient point. Um, people comfortable seeing dead bodies. I think the lawyers who don't work in criminal were probably not very comfortable at all. Um, and the point was made earlier. Did Alec want his, the lawyers to see what had happened to have that kind of burned into their minds so they wouldn't go after him for the financial stuff that was unraveling that day. He had been confronted that day. Did he want them to see that? so that that would always be in their mind. And if true, if true, that's cruel. Jessica Phillips said, I know for sure if my husband and son were killed, I would never invite all my coworkers. It's suspicious. It makes it seem like they, he wanted to contaminate the scene. I, the, this co-working situation is different, I think, than most. So JP reminded that three button attorney during the first interview is Danny Henderson, who has passed, not Mark Brill and I, Mark Ball. And that was my um, error at the beginning. Uh, Hunting Haley says, as a South Carolinian, when someone passes, we go help clean, take meals. Not ideal here, but it's how we show respect and aid during their loss. And I think that's true in a lot of communities that the phone tree is activated and everyone shows up to support. Um, and that's not. And that's not unusual depending on the community. The night of, instead of waiting till the next day, when the when the victims have not been removed from the scene yet, feels early to me. Regardless of how it affects the outcome, SLED really bungled their investigation. Agreed. This all sounds very half-assed. It's an odd, it's odd. And I I'm actually very interested in this defense expert to see what he has to say about what could have been done differently. Um Kay said you can't convict an innocent man on this BS by sled on crime is enough. You need to enlighten the listeners. I'm not quite sure what you're asking for, Kay Bogdahl, but we are covering all the aspects of this case. Uncomfortably numb. Can the prosecution ask what gave him the right to walk through an active crime scene? Law enforcement didn't stop anyone. So they were called by Alec. They showed up. And law enforcement didn't say you need to go around to the other entrance. He said, hey, Bobby, to the fire chief. And the fire chief was like, hey, he's like, hey, maybe we should close off this run. The fire chief's like, yeah, we'll get there. That's what happened at this crime scene. They all know each other. They all know each other. And no one was keeping Alex's friends away. I think law enforcement and those in charge thought it was um, compassionate to do so. I think it's a problem. And it's definitely going to turn around and bite them in the ass. So we'll see that. Emily, we need what in the Elmer Fudd is going on here? Merch. I don't know if we can. I think that's probably intellectual property of someone, not me. Um, but we'll we'll see what we do. We'll see what we do. Um, Jackie C. Jax asked this earlier. What was on the dashboard? Alec Murdoch was driving around in his Suburban with his law enforcement solicitor's badge on his dash. I imagine he parked places he couldn't park. And if somebody walked up to give it a ticket, they saw the badge and were like, hmm. drove the speed he wanted to drive because no one's going to pull him over with that badge. And he let everybody see it. Um, most prosecutors carry badges. Um, prosecutors have to go to crime scenes. 
there there are a wide variety of reasons prosecutors are an arm of law enforcement. Most carry badges. But I've never seen anyone put it on the dash of their fucking car. I have seen people terminated for improper use of their badge and for badging their way out of their own trouble. That is not what it's for. It seems like Alec Murdoch was using it for that, but that is not what it's for. So, um, <laughs> Bailey, I adore you too. It's good to see you in the chat. So if you ever, <laughs> you can just DM me if you want to chat about this case. It's why it's just, it's, it's, it's so much. It's so much. How do you think the trial is going for Alex so far in your opinion? I think there's still a lot of questions. So that means for the defense, it's going well because there's still a lot of questions and those questions have not been effectively, um, uh, put together. Um, I am not army mom. I'm sorry. I can't pronounce the first part, but the X and the Y and the dyslexic Emily is making that very hard for me. I am so sorry for your loss. And I do not doubt at all that it took four officers to remove you. I don't doubt it at all. They didn't do that at this scene. Anyone else, any other scene, no matter how hard it is and how um, cold it feels, dealing with the crime scene comes first. And that's not what Sled and Calton County did here. They did not deal with the crime scene first. And whether that goes to them trying to be compassionate towards Alec and his friends, or whether it goes to them being afraid of this powerful family, or whether they thought Solicitor Duffy Stone was going to show up, show up and yell at them, I don't know. But it's not, it's not the way that a crime scene should be run, and we're going to hear about that today, and the defense is going to use it against them. They were trying to be compassionate to Alec, and it's going to bite them squarely in the ass. Um... Jacqueline said depth seemed open and at peace with his previous bad acts, but in Alec Murdoch's case, it doesn't seem like a great idea. Yeah. And, and it did. Depth seemed to say, look, this isn't all ideal. This isn't ideal. These text messages are horrific and I'm embarrassed, but would we see that from Alec if he took the stand? I don't know. I don't know. He told his friends he was embarrassed. He told them he shit them up real good. And this might be the only reason I think Alec Murdoch should take the stand legal Legal Emily thinks that this is a terrible idea. Emily that wants the tea thinks this. Can we please ask him what the fuck he meant by shit you up real good? We need to understand. So the side of me that wants all of the tea is like, please do. Just take the stand. Ask the man the questions. He'll be on the stand for days. We're, we're living here now. We're never leaving. But the lawyer side of me? What the fuck are you thinking, man? The lawyer side of me is like, you have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. That shit only works if you use it. Founders thought it was real important. They thought it was real important. It is an enumerated right in the Constitution. You have to exercise it. But I think Alec knows better. We'll see what he thinks. Um, Amanda asked from earlier, could she have asked, quote, in your professional opinion, what percent of your clients under this kind of legal pressure have murdered their spouse and child? I mean, it would have been really objectionable to, it would have been real object. It would have been objected to immediately. Could, would the judge have granted it? I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a reach. It's a very unusual situation. Very unusual situation. Page CM said, why has it not come up that his lawyer friend had blood on him viewing the scene, but Alec did not even when he touched Paul before 911. It did come up. There's no time for argument yet. It was said the defense didn't touch it again, hoping the jury would forget. The prosecution wrote it down in their little notebooks, and they are going to argue it in closing. So there are, there are some things that happen in trial that are too good to touch, and you just let it slide because you grab it for, for closing, and then you remind the jury at closing. He said he had blood on his pants and blood on his shoulders just from going into the feed room the day after the murders. They're holding on to that for later. They're not there to, they're not there to argue yet. They're not there to tie together the dots yet. Paige said, why has solicitor Duffy Stone, who slowed down Sled and Alex's phone recovering and knowing he stepped down two months after the murders, not brought up? It's been alluded to. I don't know how much they'll argue it. I don't know if they have any foundation to argue it, but Duffy Stone's office didn't step away from running this prosecution 
until August 11th, that third interview. And that's when they turned it over to the AG's office. Should they have done it sooner? I don't know. Melanie Nix said, for anyone not able to get the all-dressed ruffles, my fiance told me the U.S. version is called the whole shebang. Are they made by ruffles? I want to know. The all-dressed chips are so fucking good. For all of you that have sent them to me at my P.O. box, thank you. I have also ordered them and imported them from Amazon. I am trying to convince Runkle to start a black market ring selling all-dressed ruffles. And he's like, I'm still a practicing attorney, Emily. I will not cede to your life of illicit ruffles. They are the best flavor. And here's the thing. I just want to make sure that the law nerd community grows enough that we can kindly pressure ruffles to release them in the U S for the love of fucking Christ. Just release, release the all dressed chips, give them to us. We have to keep grabbing them from our neighbors in the North. They're so good. Uh, Runkle, Runkle does not want to be a ruffles runner. He's like, I will not participate in your fuckery, Emily. I was like, yeah, that's fair. So Beth said, so why, quote, they did him so bad and not they did them so bad. Um, it's like someone was supposed to do the wife and not the son or vice versa. I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever have answers to that. Who else would have gone to the Murdoch residence at night knowing that the family was there and kept guns lying around and not bring their own weapons? I, the the whole law firm, apparently. Um, Melissa said, I think the cops are afraid of AM and all his attorney friends. I think so, too. In a video I saw of the boat case, two cops at the scene, one tells the other, that's the Murdoch boys, good luck. That's not a cop telling him that. That is one of the other, one of the other individuals in the boat says that. Um, he says, do you know who that is? That's, you know, do you know Alec Murdoch? That's his son. Good luck. But the officers, you hear the officers in the beginning of this case saying, do you know who this family is? It is discussed amongst the officers at the very, very beginning of this case. Elicit Ruffles brought to you by Runkle. Do you think Mark hurt the defense? His testimony about how cunning Alec is seemed like a prosecution witness. I think that was a witness that goes both ways. I think there are things that were beneficial to the defense and things that were very beneficial to the prosecution. I think that witness was better for the prosecution because they were able to get things out in cross that were helpful. And cross is always a little easier to pay attention to because it's so much more direct and you don't have to lay the foundation with those open-ended questions. Um, how much time is Alec facing on the financial crimes? Life. Do you think he will be giving a chance to plead guilty for a reduced sentence? No, I don't. I don't think so. Could this be, could it go federal so that the state cases get out of the state and the federal case and a federal case comes in? Maybe, but I don't know. But no, he's facing life. That's why I get so annoyed with this prosecution. There was no need to speed this prosecution up. And they did. There was no need for them to bring this prosecution when they did. They keep saying AM um, was not scared after the murder, but Buster did not seem worried either. Just makes you wonder. Buster didn't seem worried either. Buster also wasn't involved at all with his dad's opioids. Um, McDuff, McDuff Co. said, sorry, I sent that too soon. It's Michelle. I still have questions. I'm spending my 56th birthday today with the Law Nerds. Happy birthday. This is where we live now. To all the Law Nerds having birthdays today, happy birthday. Can we pressure the U.S. government to take away the law that prevents actual kinder eggs being sold here too? Kristen, no. Because lawyers. No, because lawyers. No, because lawyers. I think it's, I, no, because lawyers. The lawyers, the lawyers are the ones who who went on a rampage about the kinder eggs. Tinsley's opinions. I legit feel like I'm listening to the Visine Clear Eyes guy. <laughs> I'm not sure what he does is great and very important, but I'm just sleepy, not even interested. Poor jury. This jury, this jury is just. Um, Life with Gigi says, I think you should call your pickle Poot the Pickle. I we've we've got a lot of suggestions on the pickle. The pickle has a lot. There's a lot of options. McDickle the pickle. There's a lot of options for the pickle. There's a lot of options, but we will see. So with that, we've done the we've done the pickle ness. Um, we've the goat hasn't even screamed today, but we'll get there. I will be back at one ten. There will be links to where I'm going this afternoon. I will leave this stream running so we can watch court when I have to pop out and go tell lawyers about 
cases on the uh, cases on the uh, internet. I will let you know where that is. You guys can watch that on the replay. You don't have to leave court today. I think we'll be. Uh, I think it's going to be a long day today, especially in the afternoon. I'm going to go eat. You guys go eat. Let's take a break. Let's all reconvene. Good work today, team. Chat day twenty two of the three week trial that never ends. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. I couldn't, I couldn't make it through these last days without you because the chat is what's keeping me awake and invested in this case. This case is getting, it's just, it's dragging, but there's moments of like, oh, shit's happening. And that's why we keep watching. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts the Emily Show, and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>